welcome, friends, uh, to another episode of Level 1 Adventuring. Oh, that is some creepy music. I'm going <laughs> to hopefully that is uh, setting the tone for the episode, but not quite spooking uh, your eardrums as heavily as mine. I'm going to turn down mine a little bit. Hey, 20 Thod, Dylan, welcome to the stream. Always happy to see familiar faces in the chat. Uh, hello, who am I welcoming you to the stream? I am Wolf Scott. I am your host and dungeon master of this channel, uh, Level 1 Adventuring. We are a couple of different things. Primarily, we are a uh, RPG stream, both video and tabletop TTRPG. We have a bunch of different kind of content we do on Wednesdays. We typically have a long-form D&D uh, campaign, but you'll notice that's not happening tonight. Uh, when we don't have the head count, I like to switch things up, try new things. Uh, teacups punch first time chatter. What are we about today? You, I'll tell you right now. Uh, very excitingly, I was scrolling through my Twitter because I had recently done some playthroughs of some indie RPGs. Uh, lately, Rune, which is um, inspired off of Dark Souls, and Notorious, which is inspired off of um, Star Wars Bounty Hunters. Right, so I'm sort of starting to see more tweets about indie RPGs kind of come into my inbox. And I saw that a, a publisher by the name of, and I, please forgive me if I mess up this name, uh, Rene Pierre, uh, who is linked in, oh no, I'm Loki, forgot I was on this username. <laughs> That's okay. We'll take you anyway, Loki. We'll take you anyway we can get you. Um, uh, Rene Pierre. Uh, which should be linked in the go live tweet that I just posted, said that they had released their own solo RPG uh, they were very passionate about. I think it either debuted today or maybe last night, so it's like brand new fresh. Um, and it's called Firelights. And I'm sure we will uh, talk a little bit more about what the game is, but I just want to read the string, uh, the initial tweet that was made... Um, Today, actually, today's the se oh no, yesterday, yesterday uh, was on the seventh. Um, so kind of in the author's own words, right? But basically, I saw this tweet that they were coming up with this brand new uh, solo RPG. I shot my shot. I sent them a DM and said, "Hey, my name's Wolf. I run a RPG stream, bunch of different things. I see that you're you've created your own." Uh, solo RPG, if you'd like, I would love to run a session of it or however many sessions it takes uh, on the channel. Here are some other ones I've run if you know you're interested. Um, and we can, you know, go from there. And they were so kind enough to send me a sort of uh, a, a release copy. Um, so this is, you. the link that I have pinned to the top of the channel should be the link that they shared in the Twitter thread. So you should be able to buy this for yourself for like five bucks or like six bucks. It's like you know, very affordable. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they sent me uh, a free copy to, to play on stream. And so that, that's so exciting. I love that. Like I'm, I'm like a part of the indie RPG scene somehow now, like even in a small way, you know, like I'm helping people kind of blast their creation across the internet. And that's very neat. Uh, oh, speaking of uh, free and blasting things around the internet, a shout out to tabletop audio for letting us uh, create, uh, I should say, letting us use their amazing library of um, free-to-use uh, soundtracks. Uh, there's going to be some spooky sounds you should be hearing because I think it'll fit the theme. And then maybe there'll be some more dramatic music. And thank you, Streamlabs and Streamspell, for um, all the stream elements and all the other sound effects and things that you'll see throughout the stream today. Uh, and I guess before I get into the, 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 the Twitter thread... Um, Join us on all the things on the YouTube where this will be uploaded later if you haven't been able to see it live. Um, and on the Discord where we talk about all the games that we're going to be running in the future or just hanging out and sharing memes. Um, yeah, follow us on all the things. We'd love to see your faces there. Um, Mochi! We got Loki. We got Mochi. We got 20th. We got like all of the heavy hitters. If Now we just need Ailing and the gang will be all here. Uh, but we got all of the, the regulars. We love to have them back. I'm so excited. Uh, yeah, and this is going to be just an interesting, I think it's going to be an interesting uh, adventure. Come make friends, says Loki. Yes, make friends with all of us. We dare you. <laughs> Um, but anyway, I want to read through Renee's, Rene Pierre's, um, who's at RPD Chase, RPD Chase at Twitter, Twitter, once again, linked above. Um, this is the thread, uh, that they wrote about their game. 
So it says, here we go. Firelights, my Metroidvania inspired TTRPG is now live on Edge. So that's also right, right from right from the beginning. Metroidvania, right, implies some things if you're in the know when it comes to like game design, right? We're gonna be exploring, we're gonna be backtracking, um, re-exploring areas, which is gonna is gonna be interesting. Um, so my Metroid inspired Metroidvania inspired TTRPG is now live on Twitch. Firelights is a condensed solo or co-op RPG about a guided journey across a plagued land. It is a game of exploration, discovery, and challenges. The entire game, its lore, mechanics, tables, and character sheet all fit on one trifold pamphlet. And, and they are not kidding. You're looking at the PDF right here. This is it. Trifold pamphlet. And we love that for solo RPGs because if you're running this by yourself, hopefully you don't want the game to be too involved and too complex. So you're going to have to be cross-referencing the rules every other minute uh, by yourself. And even if you are, hey, at least if it is like a small condensed rule book, that's not the worst. So pretty impressive that this all fits on this two-page PDF. Um... The, and the game feature, uh, the game cover features an astonishing cover by none other than user G. Pichot. And this is a very pretty cover, by the way. We're just going to throw that out there. We love some evocative art. Uh, it says, using only the most accessible gaming material, which are two six-sided dice, a deck of cards, and a notebook, you will tackle challenges, avoid dangers, explore and create a map of the land, fight dangerous bosses, search for treasures, and more. Okay, so also I like that you're not required to do a lot of buy-in. You know, you can play this with a, a deck of cards and some dice. Uh, very easy to find dice too. Six-sided dice, not like the D&D &D dice where you need like seven different kinds, uh, which is also great. Uh, because we are playing digital, uh, I have digitally uh, equated all these tools. We know this this handy dice roller from all of our rune playthroughs. So we're going to... Oh, oh, you can't see it. I'm, I'm on the Just Chatting stream. Um, which means nobody saw any of the things I said. Oh, okay. Look at this. Okay, here we go. Trifold pamphlet. Trifold pamphlet rulebook. Two-page PDF. Beautiful cover art. I was referencing what I, what I had before but didn't show, right? Uh, so that's the first part. Uh, we got a dice roller that we use for rune all the time. There we go, says Mochi. I'm like talking about the things and I don't realize you can't see the things. Um, and uh, uh, looks very cool. Yeah, I, I I think once you start reading, when I start reading the actual lore, people are going to like really perk up. It's very interesting. Uh, but yeah, this picture already does a lot to like sell you kind of what's going on. Um, and what's very funny is I was looking around my apartment today. I was like, I have to have a stack, a, a deck of cards somewhere, right? I don't. I have like decks of tarot cards, which I was like, can I make that work? But I was like trying to on stream, like in my mind, recollect like what regular cards or what tarot cards live is probably going to be a mess. But hey, it turns out you can just find uh, a digital deck of cards uh on this website so that's what we're going to be using which is going to be great since you have to use the deck to do a couple of things as well uh and like build it out so this this will be helpful um all right and then where was i here so those are our materials very simple stuff uh the text of the game is 100 percent open licensed under the ccby license isn't technology wonderful sometimes as we know from my stream <laughs> sometimes it's great Sometimes technology betrays me, uh, but for the most part, it's wonderful, and I'm very thankful <laughs> to be in the era in which it exists. Um, but yeah, 100% licensed under the CCBY license, um, which is why they've also developed the Firelights Creator Kit, which you can use to create your own game based on Firelights. So another cool thing is that if you yourself are an aspiring TTT, 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 TTRPG creator, and you'd like a basis for like how to build out, you know, your own stuff. It's already open for you to use, which is great. And then on top of this, they say uh, they've decided to launch a Firelights Jam. The Jam launches on March 1st and lasts for two months. The goal, design and publish a game based on Firelights. So they're actually doing, um, they're actually doing a, uh, 
they're opening up you to send in your creations and see if you can iterate on their system they've just created, which is very, very cool. Um, and I wanted to see, there's a great, oh yeah, so this is, I think, what's going to link people in. So it's Metroidvania, right? Renee also says, this game leapt to my mind like a flash and every mechanic in here was designed to emulate some of their favorite video games like Ori in the Blind Forest, Hollow Knight, and Breath of the Wild, right? So three very cool titles. If you are, if you are fans of any of those three titles, uh, then you're going to see some influences from them in here, which is awesome. Uh, and that is pretty much everything that exists on the Twitter thread at this time. Uh, well, except for the replies that tells you more about Firelights. Um, so yeah, six bucks, brand new indie RPG, um, solo or co-op storytelling game that you can design for right now. And we get to kind of, I don't think we're like the first playthrough, but we're kind of like a debut stream, I guess, if it released like yesterday. So that's kind of cool. Um, 20th says, oh, that reminds me, how did the darkest dungeon stream yesterday go? Um, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, I like the, the tactical element of it. I like the, the enemy designs. The art is beautiful. Um, you know, it's definitely going to take get me some getting used to. Like, it's obviously designed to be a um, resource management game, um, which I didn't expect as much going in. And it's very hard. I mean, we are level one, and we already had one of our characters die uh, <laughs> because they drank a blood potion. I thought it would help them. They were, like, already almost dead. So I was like, a blood potion can't hurt. And then it literally murdered them. Um, so it doesn't hold your hand. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I think there will be more Darkest Dungeon. Uh, the only thing I'm kind of, and I said this on the last stream too, but maybe, you know, 20th, you can, um, you can illuminate me as we, as we go on. The only thing I'm a little bit nervous about is, you know, it does, it seems to kind of be a little abstract, doesn't have like a linear narrative. It's more about you just completing challenges and fighting bosses and, and, and cool enemies and getting better and stuff, which is cool. Um, but obviously I like really narrative focus driven games that give me like a distinct, beginning, middle, and end, so I can follow through on the stream. Um, also, I did get a YouTube video pop-up that's apparently the teaser for the upcoming mod for Dark's Dungeon. Sick! All right. Uh, looks like our monetization engines are firing on all cylinders. <laughs> it's called the Black Reliquary. Ooh, I'll have to take a look at it. Uh, but yeah, so I do like it. I think there will be more of it. Um, but I also, you know, I'm also looking at games that have more of a narrative through line so it kind of gives me a better idea of like when this is going to begin when this is going to end especially if darkest dungeon 2 is coming out you know i'd like to find some level of like finality from the first game before i transition into the to the next game uh but i but it is fun and i do like it and the art is so cool uh so i think there will be more of it another game that i'm looking at is banner saga um which is a very beautifully crafted like artistic rpg but it very much it seems to me like from what i've seen and read very narratively driven very linear story so that i can wrap my head around a bit more um but still i think there'll be more dark dungeon um okay so back into the main event which is firelight Ooh, my whole my whole uh my whole apartment just shuddered <laughs> for some reason uh okay I'm going to, oh, why did you just turn green? Oh, because my highlight's green? Okay, I don't know why that's happening. <laughs> I just turned off all the art, apparently. Uh, I guess, that's all right. We're not going to be referencing it too, too, too much. Um, so, let's actually, if I just re, where's my Firelight folder? I have so many folders for different games now. Let's just reopen it and see what happens. Bop. Bop. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. You might see a sneak peek of some enemies and some characters there that I've generated. Uh, okay, so uh, let's read through the center of Firelights here. It says, um, For generations, the departed have been trapped in their undead form all across the land of Penumbra, tormenting and plaguing our world. The firelights, who once guided the dead through the veil, have vanished, but there is still hope. Their last cocoons just hatched under the careful eyes of the protectors, and you are the last of the firelights. 
you must traverse through swarms of lifeless creatures, ignite all of the land's old beacons, and lead the dead through the veil once more. So that right there is already a very, very cool <laughs> concept. Uh, we're sort of, we are a firelight. We are this little, this little guardian, this little uh, farrier of undead souls uh, to their next, to their next place, uh, which is pretty fun and interesting. We already have some lore-filled terms like the protectors, the veil. It's already selling certain ideas, right? All right, so it says the basics. All right, this tells you what you need. So we already talked about that. Um, standard deck of cards, which we got. Two-sided die. Um, starting the game to play. Make sure you have a couple hours. All right, we got that. Uh, shuffle and place your story deck. All right. Uh, so I don't know if it was, it's been explicitly stated here yet, but I just want everyone to know that we're a bug. <laughs> Maybe not like an actual bug, but we are a firelight, right? And their last cocoons just hatched. So we're like kind of a bug. Um, we'll see if it explicitly states that we're a bug. I feel like it did somewhere and I'm just, I'm, I'm, oh yeah, yeah, right here. Um, so creating your firelight, choose your name and preferred pronouns. I already have some ideas for that. Your character has three approaches, forceful, patient, and quick. These are like your stats. Assign one a plus two, another a plus one, and a third defaults to zero. All right, perfect. Bugs and Steve Gutenberg seem to be the theme this week. Listen, I'm not saying that I planned it, but, you know, maybe I planned it. Um, striving for your goal. While the firelights were gone, gigantic shadowy entities called curses have started spawning across the land, corrupting everything they touch, extinguishing the beacon beacons, and thus preventing the dead from crossing through to the veil. You are the last of the firelights. You are a very rare kind of insect. All right, that's cool. I, as a kid who loves bugs, kid who loved bugs, and as an adult who still enjoys bugs, that's cool, you get to be a bug. Uh, and only you have the ability to reignite the six beacons, fight curses, and guide the undead back through the veil once more. So we're gonna talk a little bit about character creation. Once again, very straightforward, but I have some ideas uh, set aside. Uh, so y'all know that when I play the solo RPGs, I like to generate some art, some, some little AI art. Uh, and so I'm going to unveil our firelight, the first firelight to awaken from the, co the cocoon to help guide the dead back to their, to their rightful resting place uh look at this guy this is this is our this is our firelight um so i kind of imagine them as this sort of praying mantis-esque humanoid creature wearing a red robe uh i carries a walking stick and has sort of a, a lantern at its tip right um so literally carrying the last of the beacon's light with them as they travel across the land, reigniting the beacons to help the other, the other long lost souls kind of find their way home. Uh, I think the character's name, because there's a couple stats that they want you to, to give them, a name, preferred pronouns, and some other things. Uh, the character in my mind, so it's the last thing, right? It's kind of like this alien life form that just kind of wakes up from the cocoon but it sort of intrinsically knows its purpose, right? Like it knows it has to light the fire, but no one's really telling them that, right? They just sort of understand that it's their cosmic place in the, the order of like the metaphysics of the universe. Um, so I don't think it has like a regular name. First of all, I don't think it has a regular identity. I think, I think, I think they don't really perceive gender. So I think they are they them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do... My, I play so many dude characters, I'm going to try my best to be very stringent about the, the pronouns. Uh, but I think they, them, and I think that they don't have a... They don't have, like, a name because no one's really given them a name, right? It's not like they, they, they woke up and someone said, you are <laughs> Steve Gutenberg II, right? Like... <laughs> Like, although that uh, that could be maybe a canon, <laughs> Jimmy <laughs> Jimmy Morrison's yes. Um, so I think this character sort of awakens with their acknowledgement of a name of sort of their purpose, right? And their name is sort of more their purpose than it is their their actual nomenclature. So our character's name is Last Wish, right? 
It's loaded with meaning. It's the last of the firelights, the wish to burn the, the beacons. It is the last wish of the undead to find their way home, right? Uh, so this being just sort of intrinsically understands its purpose and thus kind of names itself, or perhaps the protectors, right? This disembodied force um, that has a, has awakened, awoke, awakened the last firelight. Perhaps the, the protectors have um, resonated this name within the mind of Last Wish. Uh, but this is Last Wish. Uh, last Wish. Uh, so we have this red-robed, mantoid, sort of fire-bearing wanderer here. So then we have to decide... Oh, and then they them. Bubba. Then we have to decide a couple of their stats. Now, the really the stats, as far as I understand them here, is really about how we approach situations in the world. We can either be forceful, patient, or quick. Now, I'd like to imagine that, that uh, the primary power of last wish is patience you know um i think i think last wish knows that the journey will be long and hard and they're the only ones who can uh possibly oh excuse me uh can possibly uh help it to to be successful so i think they are patient i think they are understanding they're calm the way they will deal with undead should they find them and help you know kind of speak to them and help them find their place in the world uh, or in the afterlife, I should say. Uh, I think they're very patient and understanding and kind. Um, and I also, now forceful and quick are tough for me to decipher against. I, I'm not getting a forceful vibe, but I can see how like the, you know, sort of the, the, the equal and opposite of patience, right? Like perhaps they're very patient but when they have to be very, you know, um, certain, they can, you know, exert a lot of a lot of pressure and a lot of force. Um, but I also kind of like the idea that because they kind of look so mantis-like and, and like lithe and like I don't know, nimble. Perhaps they're they're better to be quick and and perhaps um, you know, quickness also um, equates to they want to try and be quick. They want to try to light the 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 beacon swiftly because who knows. Um, if they'll get a chance to be to be burnt again, uh, you know, they are the last firelight. So I think I'm kind of answering my own question here in terms of character creation. I think I'm leaning quick. So we're going to go patience two, quick one, forceful zero. Uh, and those will obviously come into play with the things that we have to roll as we continue play. Okay. Uh, so now that we have our firelight, last wish. Oh, and I, I, you know, and when I when I heard the name last wish, I started thinking uh, all of my Skyrim friends in chat will, uh, you know, I uh, know this will click. I started thinking about like um, the Khajiit and how they have sort of like abstract names sometimes, or I should say some some of them do. But really, I was thinking about how the Khajiit remind me of the Tabaxi in D and D who also have really abstract names like Last Wish. Um, so in my mind, I kind of feel like um, Last Wish might might have a Khajiit-like delivery. Hmm, sort of a mysterious, mysterious delivery. Ooh, Khajiit. But what's the, what's the line they always say? May your roads lead to warm sands. You know, like that. That's how I kind of feel Last Wishes they're, they're gonna sound like to my, to my mind. Um, if they even speak, they might just they might just transmit these thoughts psychically, you know? That's, that's something to think about. Uh, all right, so striving for our goal. Um, yes, we want to relight the beacons. That's our main thing. So making an action. Actions guide your journey across the world. Makes sense. Each one is a self-contained system, which helps you resolve the actions you have or the actions you want to take when making an action. Uh, Go through the following. Draw two cards face up from the story deck, our deck of cards. Uh, roll and sum our two action dice uh, and add any modifiers you get to your roll to, to get your score. So I, I suppose if we have to take the action forcefully, quickly, or patiently, we'll be a zero, one, or two. Uh, yeah, zero, one, or two. I was like, zero, one, or what? Math numbers. Uh, then interpret the results as follows. Then discard the cards. If your score is higher than both cards, you discover light. If your score is higher than only one card, there is shade. Otherwise, there is darkness. So whether there is light, shade, or darkness will imply sort of effects 
on things that happen in the game world. So we're seeing a, a you know firelights, curses, darkness. We're seeing a big light versus shadow theme happening in the in the um, the verbiage of the rules, which is always fun to have evocative rule sets going on. Um, aces are worth one, jacks are eleven, queens are twelve, kings are worth thirteen. Okay. And then each action is formatted with action plus modifier and tells you what happens when there's light, shade, or darkness. Okay. Um, and these are all the actions here. So things you'd probably expect when you're playing a uh, uh, any sort of adventure game, when you're either confronting risk, searching for treasures, buying info, discovering new regions, fighting a curse, which are the monsters, avoiding danger, or getting an answer from the oracle, which, interesting. Getting an answer from the Oracle. I don't know if I've gotten that far yet, but we'll see. Um, exploring the world. When you start the game... Oh! You mean like right now? When I'm starting the game? Uh, so here we go. Who's ready? Who's ready to take last wish through the realm of penumbra? Of darkness? Of the undead? Um, I am. I think I am. Um, all right, let's take a look here. When you start the game, draw a card from the story deck and place it face up in front of you. So this is going to be the beginning of our story deck. I'm going to shuffle it up. Why not? Because I'm feeling nervous. <laughs> all right, draw my card. It is in front of me. Ah, it's a 10. Okay, what happens? <laughs> I don't know yet. Uh, this is where you are right now. As you discover the land, you will add more cards to your world map, each card being a new region. Okay, so it's kind of like a point crawl, and the cards are the point crawl. Interesting. Kind of novel. Um, yeah, let's zoom in. Okay. Um, uh, each card being a new region. When you add a new region card, the corner of your card needs to connect with another region's corner. So, yeah, it is a map. To know whether the region you are adding is located below, beside, or above your current location, uh, compare the numbers of both cards and interpret the results. Okay. So, if the number on the new card is higher, place the card above. If it is lower, place the card below. Otherwise, beside. Ah. The corner of your card needs to connect with another region's corner. Interesting. Uh, use rolling tables for inspiration. Play slips of paper on top of the cards to note down details. We have a <laughs> we have a one note document which is going to take us through this as always when I play my solo RPGs. Uh, but yes, uh, good idea to have some paper uh, handy. Igniting the six beacons. The six beacons of Penumbra served as a guide for the dead to navigate through the veil. Even to this day, they continue to emit a subtle mystical smoke. Ooh, spooky. If the card you add to the map is a face card, Jack, Queen, or King, that region includes a beacon. Okay, so that is how we know we've either found a destination we, we need to take the dead to. Resting in fatigue. You may have to mark fatigue as a result of an action. When your fatigue is full or your story deck is empty, you have to rest or flee to live a day, another day, or risk extinguishing your light. When you rest, fill an entry in your journey book, shuffle all the cards you discarded when making actions, and clear fatigue. Okay, so that's kind of how we uh, avoid um, running out of cards to be able to make all of our beacons. Okay. Encountering curses. If you encounter a curse, you may confront them. Build a stack of cards as described in the Fight a Curse section. When the number of cards of the stack matches the curse's strength, they fade away and perish. Okay, so then we can see the type of creature here. I, I generated some art here. So there's technically only four types of creatures, although they are very evocatively named and described. Um, and there's also kind of like a bug or like a creature, like sort of like a backyard critter kind of theme, which is interesting too. Um, so essentially cards and dice will be our determining factors on how we defeat and, and move through the world here, especially, um, with the curses and then the rest are the actions. So I think what we have to do is figure out where we are and then start traveling. So, uh, discover region when you look for a new power. So let's first establish where we are and what's interesting about it and kind of what's going on here so this is last wish npcs enemies i'm gonna start a new tab 
for the journey, right? And our first is the 10 of clubs, right? Spades? <laughs> Not clubs. <laughs> the ace of spades! <laughs> Not yet. But it will. It will be a thing. Uh, all right. So why don't we why don't we use some of these dice to help us discover what's going on in the region? So in my mind, okay. So uh, well, yeah. All right. Sorry, my brain is going a million miles per hour. First, let's figure out what's going on in our region. I'm gonna roll. I'm gonna roll two of them. I'm gonna go for the region and the theme. So we're gonna go bum bum. Uh, so eleven, right? If this is twelve, this would be. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, eight, nine, ten, eleven. No. Am I a five and a six? A five and a six. Okay, yeah. Maybe I'll just read it that way. I'm like, uh, the numbers adding up? Oh, of course. Uh greatly showing my uh <laughs> my my big brain. I'm already gonna have to look at the definition of an estuary. <laughs> I feel like I know a lot of good words, but that one is definitely throwing me for a loop automatically. A partially enclosed coastal body of brackish water with one or more rivers or streams flowing into it. Okay. Um, well, thank you for making me feel a fool on stream, Rene Pierre. <laughs> First destination you gave me is a word I don't understand. Okay. So we know the region is an estuary, uh, but what is kind of the vibe? What is the theme of the area and then and then we'll start going into like our narrative and like what's going on here um so then i'm gonna roll two more i got a six and a three so i got a three and a six uh love love a love estuary okay so from here i'm gonna try to divine what's happening but before that i kind of want to just get into the mindset of how this journey begins for us so Essentially, I imagine, you know, we're not really a living thing. We are more like a, you know, we, we are a cosmic concept. We're like, I don't want to say we're like celestial, but like we're not, we're not mortal. You know, we exist in the veil to help the undead cross over. So I don't think we're like living in the traditional sense. And so I don't think we are born and we don't, we don't have life cycles in the traditional sense. I don't think we have the concept of being born. So I think for us, there's just darkness, really, right? In the beginning, there's just an infinite darkness, just like an infinite sleep, um, a, a never waking consciousness. We don't even realize we are or are not, right? We just, we're neither <laughs> and both. Uh, until, of course, uh, one day, not that we have the concept of a day by any means, but one fateful day, uh, we hear a grand reverberation that sort of echoes throughout every fiber of our being, if we even have a corporeal form at this point, right? It just rattles us to our very core. Um, and we, you know, we hear this voice, uh, this disembodied voice. And perhaps it is not one voice, but perhaps it is the voice of, of multiple voices, a chorus of voices, uh, of, of different peoples and languages and times and places all speaking simultaneously you know like sort of through one grand funnel uh directly into our into our un uh unwaking mind and it's sort of just like a you know it is time it is time to open your eyes you know so something to that effect um and um you know then we start like our we start to feel maybe for the first time in this sort of cosmic nothingness, we begin to feel that we actually have form and we have we have limitations, right? It's not that we can just uh, to feel and perceive infinitely. There is, a, there is a finite amount of space that we can feel or see. And right now it's still dark, but we are very much aware that, you know, our thoughts are now bound into shapes and those shapes are things that for some reason we want to call arms and we don't know why and we want to call them legs and we don't know why we can't even see them yet it's still dark but we know they're there and we know that they are us somehow um and you know that voice is just echoing in the back of our minds and it uh you know you are our last wish you are their only hope light the beacons it is 
your time. And then with that, we're going to say there's like a, a splintering in front of us, like a crack of light um, that sort of punctures through our, our infinite waves of darkness that are surrounding us. And at first, you know, it, it, it almost feels like... A, like almost like a, a sea of starlight has like split through uh, this infinite black void. But as we begin to get more of our wits about us, we can actually see it's more like uh, the splinter of a crack of a window pane or perhaps like the strike of a hammer to a stone and there's something crumbling and cracking and shifting uh, and, you know, sort of tentatively, uh, confusedly, because we don't exactly even know what is going on yet, uh, we reach out towards the light and we feel something physical against our hands, or at least what our mind tells us are our hands, uh, and we push forward, and suddenly that resistance, that darkness all around us finally breaks and cracks and falls to pieces uh, in front of us and at our, our feet, and we're sort of blinded for a moment by this overwhelming light that is just, you know, shocking our senses. Uh, we were so warm and, and nestled in this infinite shadow, and now we have to be... Uh, 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 unvery ceremoniously uh, dragged into the light uh, and, it, and it blinds us and it shocks us. Um, but once we sort of lower our gaze and begin to adjust to our surroundings, uh, I think what we see, number one, I think we see we're sort of in the center of this massive dome like, oh, mochi, feed, feed beans a taco, feed beans a taco. How you feeling, Beans? You full, buddy? Almost level, almost level 12, it looks like. Getting there. Yeah, that's his favorite. Good job, Moch. <laughs> uh, I think we, the first thing that we see is this overwhelming light that has, uh, you know, stolen our senses uh, is actually the light burning from the top of a lantern. And that lantern is situated on a walking stick, which is set in the center of this massive cylindrical, this dome-like room, right? And, you know, I imagine that from the lantern, there's probably like another, like little offshoot of the handle that hangs off the side. So we can like, you know, if we were carrying it, we could also rest our weight on to help us trudge forward. But hanging from that, that little, that little bent arm is a long shawl of red cloth, right? And so we sort of peer our way, we sort of crack our way out of out of this this shell that we have found ourselves in. We take a look around now. We can, obviously the first thing we see is the light and the shawl, which is billowing ever so mysteriously and somewhat dramatically, like you know, in the the near the near non-existent wind. Um, but we can look around us now, and I think what we see, because we are the last firelight, right? I think what we see around us is that this place almost feels like a, almost like a temple. It's all carved out of stone. There's probably like hieroglyphics and, and symbols and runes that are carved on the walls depicting, um, you know, sort of uh, grand cosmological events and like sort of what our purpose would be in this world, you know, probably symbols of the beacons being lit. I don't think we have full understanding of all of that, but that is what is around us as well as other pods, other stone pods, right? Which um, they surround us on our, our floor, which I imagine we're kind of towards the bottom, right? But then there's also like, tiered walkways that you know um that line all sides of this circular chamber and those also all have pods on them right and as we look around we see that all of the other pods have been already opened right um but they're empty or alternatively they look like they've been smashed right whether maybe purposefully smashed or perhaps like over time and wear and tear, some of the stones and the ruins have crumbled in and like destroyed the pods that would have been, you know? Um, we kind of get the distinct feeling there's an eerie silence and an uncomfortable uh, alone <laughs> feeling uh, that sort of bears down on us as we sort of realize that there may have been others that came into this, this existence like us, but they're not here now and they may not have been for, for you know, untold amounts of time. 
Uh, and so very gingerly, you know, nakedly. I, I, don't, I don't know if we have the concept of shame for our naked form. Uh, although perhaps... Perhaps intrinsically we do, since we do wear the clothes, right? Like, we, we, there's the part of us that feels just unprotected now, you know? Like, we were in the safe, warm cocoon of, like, infinite cosmic nothingness, and now we have to be brought into the harsh light of reality, or quasi-reality. Uh, and so I think we scamper, sort of, um, you know, uh, nervously towards the light, and we curiously inspect it and i'd like to imagine too because we're the firelight right i like to imagine that we sort of have this mantis like body you know we're covered in this like uh i always want to say uh chitin but i think it's chitin <laughs> uh you know sort of the bug plating uh we have like sort of a mottled brownish grayish complexion um but i like to imagine that perhaps our our antennae you know are like big and billowy they're almost like a moth um, and there's sort of like a bioluminescent element of them uh, that gives off sort of like a soft radiant glow. And it does, it's orange and red, right? Like it's, it's almost like watching uh, embers sort of be kindled by a firelight, um, like literally at this point by, by firelight, uh, like that's sort of out of our head. And so depending on what we're detecting or trying to see or feel or whatever, um, you know, that will sort of glow with greater intensity or not. And I think we're we're inspecting the lantern because we're confused by it and we don't understand why it's there, but we we do understand its significance. We do understand its importance somehow. It's the only other thing that is showing any sign of animacy uh, in this place other than us. And so as we're like gazing into the fire, um, I think you know that voice sort of reverberates back within our mind, and uh, you know we're sort of struck still by it. And it's like last wish, peer into the flame. It shall tell you all. And so, you know, we we have no other we have no other reason to not believe this otherworldly voice. Uh, and so I think we do. We sort of slowly take the staff into our hands, we sort of crane our like bug-like body up and we look into the flame. Uh, and I think this is that moment where the sort of great divine uh, inference happens, right? Like we're staring into the flame. It's almost like we're scrying on a candlelight sort of spell. We're like looking into the fire, we're watching it dance, and then we begin to see shapes happen and we get, we begin to see uh, events form out of the cinders and the ash and the light. Uh, and we begin to see history play out, probably scores of history uh, in front of us. It, well, I should say more, the, the fire becomes a portal to those images in our mind, right? And suddenly all of those hieroglyphs and all those runes and these stories all around us begin to make uh, very uh, cohesive and, 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 and uh, perfect sense uh, as we begin to sort of download the entirety of the purpose of the firelights and why we're here um, and sort of the perils of of the situation that Penumbra's in. We are sort of in the place between worlds. We are, we are in the veil. Um, and the veil is collapsing because darkness has taken over and the curses are running rampant and the dead do not know how to find their way home. Uh, and so with all of that raging before us and sort of burning uh, its, its knowledge into our mind, I think there's a moment where, you know, finally that connection sort of breaks and we like, <gasps> you know, we sort of break out of it. Our little antennas are, are glowing with like newfound power. Um... And, uh, you know, the voice, you know, reverberates once again. Do you now understand? You know, sort of shaking through our carapace. And we're like, I understand, protectors. Uh, we now know these things are the protectors. They are the purpose. Uh, they, are the, they are the sort of uh, deific consciousness which is guiding our actions. Um, good. Take the lantern. Relight the beacons. It is... The only way. The only way. I repeat, sort of, uh, almost outside of myself, as I take the shawl and I throw it over my shoulders, I fasten it tightly, uh, I take the walking stick, I stamp it on the ground once there's a burst of, of new light. It sort of glows, I think, once I've sort of attuned with it, once I've sort of uh, understood my purpose, uh, I think the fire burns even more brightly and perhaps the bioluminescent like embers in my own antenna I also burn with like a renewed sort of sense of vigor um, as I 
am now fully uh, sort of anointed a firelight. Uh, and I have to... Maybe I take one look behind me back towards the back towards the cocoon and you know it's interesting when i when i first pushed my way out of it the cocoon felt infinite you know it felt like i was in a well of darkness and not like in a bad way it was like comforting it was it was everywhere and it was nowhere and it didn't matter where i was or wasn't i just was uh, and now that I look at it, I can see that there's a very clear inside and there's a very clear constraint and it's stone and it's and it's um, cold and it's... Um, I think there's a part of me that both mourns the loss of what the cocoon once was to me um, and is also, in a way, I want to say relieved or like illuminated, like to know that I... There is so much more beyond it and that I have more to do um, in this life. Uh, I mean, I didn't know I had a life until a moment ago, but I think there is a sense of both of loss and longing to like the familiar and the comfortable, but also a, uh, I've never known what it's like to have a to have a purpose and now I do. And I think that is also very fortifying in its own way. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's sort of the beginning of our story. <laughs> uh, and now let's go back to this estuary of love. So I think I take the, the firelight staff and I begin walking my way through the temple. Um, and I begin walking my way out towards... Are you trying to find... I think there's a part of me that's trying to find the exit. But it's almost like my feet are being guided by a force outside of myself, right? I don't really need guidance. Um, I, I already kind of know the way out. Uh, it just takes me a little bit to get reacquainted with the twisting passages. I do take some time to, like, enjoy all of the paintings and the murals and the etchings now that I have sort of an understanding of them beyond, you know, just art. I now know of the the implications of their stories. And there is a part of me that stays a while with some of them uh, to sort of recollect that. Um, perhaps there's a part of me too that might even feel like I've been there before. Maybe the firelights, and this is just something we can play with, perhaps the firelights are more of like a like a collective consciousness, almost like a hive mind throughout all of time, you know? So maybe there's even a part of me that feels like I've been there before and I saw that before and I experienced that before or some variation of me, if not the me now, um, you know? And there's, once again, probably a sense of, of longing for that, for, for times once had. Uh, but I eventually pry myself away. I find the, the exit of the temple, the, the alien structure, and I push the doors open. So here we are in the first area. So Penumbra, right? Um, I don't think Penumbra is a land Penumbra. <laughs> penumbra and the Vale. I don't think Penumbra and the Vale are a landscape like you and I would ever fully understand it to be. I think kind of like the art implies here, I think Penumbra is... It's a realm of spirit, right? It's a it's a realm of the other world and the afterlife and between life. And so I don't think the landscape reflects actualities or totalities. I think they're all reflections of, of ideas, of feelings, of concepts, right? I feel like uh, Penumbra and the Veil are abstract by their very nature. And to, a, to an extent, I feel like they're, it is shaped by the feelings and the experiences and the emotions of the things that pass through it or have passed through it. Um, so I think when we talk about Penumbra in the Veil, what we see, I think we have to look beyond just the physical initial aspects of it. And I think instead we will also find um, sort of more spiritual or like uh, emotional inferences in, in the land itself, right? So I'm going to go with like this picture as... Um, primary inspiration so i think the world is sort of cast in shades of blue and purple and sort of like an otherworldly kind of you know it's not the greens and blues of earth that we're familiar with um i definitely think it is uh sort of shrouded in purples and blues and uh maybe there's like a, a constant roiling uh kind of silvery mist that laps at our, our at our feet, you know, especially uh, now that the the beacons are unlit, uh, and as the name implies, the the rule set implied, right? Uh, all that remains out of them is a 
a gentle wasp of mystical smoke. So perhaps that mystical smoke uh, just sort of swims throughout the the air and the night sky of 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 penumbra proper um but yeah so when i see the estuary of love so what does this mean so this is this is the place that we we open up we open up the um the temple so it's in the temple what i imagine it to be so this where is a connection of riverbanks i kind of imagine all right there's the temple situated on like a lake, right? Uh, in sort of the center of this basin. And from that basin, rivers split off in all directions, stretching all across Penumbra in various degrees. And they, and they conjoin and they rejoin and they split off and they reconnect and they spill out into other parts of the land further than I can see, further than the mist will take my eye, right? But when we say love, what I think is happening there is like dotted throughout some of the rivers and maybe even in some of the water, maybe half sunk in the water or maybe, you know, splitting some of the rivers if they're built into a natural like land formation are statues, right? And these statues depict people and in various states of, of emotion, right? Um, I think, you know, obviously when we hear love, um, we can think of some uh, statues as like uh, two lovers maybe embracing or like holding hands and you know like the river runs underneath their like clasped hands. I think some, because love can take so many forms and definitions, right? I think some depict even more painful aspects of love. Like maybe like there's one where, uh, you know, you see one figure sort of like reaching outward uh, towards another statue, it seems to be moving away towards like another statue's open hand. So like an unrequited love or like a love affair. Um, perhaps there is one um, that is like on, it's like hands and knees and like crying. And you know, the, the river water is like pouring from the statue's eyes like back into the river. But that's sort of the interesting thing is, is these rivers, whether the love comes from like a familiar love or a friendly love or a romantic love or a broken heart or what have you, right? Or the, the loss of a loved one. Um, all of the water sort of trickles back into itself and feeds back into itself and then stretches out into new rivers infinitely, right? So it just kind of shows how these emotions, how we feel for people and ourselves and, uh, and each other um, are all sort of permutations of the same emotion and they can happen infinitely and cyclically throughout our lives and throughout other people's lives. Like our love can affect other people's love, can affect other people's emotions and, and situations. Um, so yeah, I think that's what we see. Like we, we open out the doors um, and there's a big stone bridge that leads like uh, over the basin towards like the, you know, the next area. Um, but spreading out from all directions are um, these these statues of like of heartfelt scenes that are pouring out sort of like a it's almost like an in, like we don't know where the water begins and maybe it doesn't even really matter where it begins maybe the water just infinitely springs up like a fountain from beneath the the temple itself um but it all sort of spills out into the rest of penumbra so that's what i'm gonna interpret that as um hopefully that seems cool to everybody uh, so I'm going to make a few notes here. So uh, infinite numbers of rivers interlocking and spreading across the realm. Uh, the rivers, the rivers are decorated and dotted by statues of, I want to say too, that like we don't exactly like, I kind of like the idea that yeah, like, like we, we're kind of bug like. But I kind of like the idea that perhaps maybe not everything in this world is like a bug equivalent. You know, maybe it's our, our particular role as a firelight that makes us this like the veil. Maybe the statues are more like humanoid, but like still to a degree, they're kind of faceless. You know, they, they, it's kind of like time or the weather or the curses, right, have like worn down the stone, if this is even made of stone. Uh, and so we can't exactly see... If they're fully human, we probably even can't really detect like any defining attributes in terms of like, I don't know, sex or anything like that. Like they're just, 
they're all sort of like kind of somewhat formless and all um and vaguely humanoid but that's all we kind of get from them um so the rivers are decorated with dot statues of humanoid figures expressing vastly different emotions um ba -ba -ba -ba. and then the rivers of these emotions fuse bend turn in on themselves and spill out endlessly okay so this is our first zone this is our this is zone one <laughs> You can really tell when it comes to storytelling games, I just I just decide to go all in when it comes to like descriptors, especially when you're playing a game like this where it's like abstract, right? You can kind of let your imagination go wild, which is part of the fun. Uh, okay, so what are the actions we can take? We can confront risk. So far, as far as we know, there's no risk. We can search for treasures. We can buy information, but we need treasures to buy information. We can discover a region. We will eventually have to do that. So far, we don't know if there's a curse or we can get an answer from the Oracle. Interesting. Okay, let's get an answer from the Oracle. Let's see. First thing I want to do is say, are we alone? Uh, when you want an answer to a yes or no question, action plus two if likely, action plus zero if unlikely, action plus one if otherwise. So um, just to double check here. Each action is formatted action modifier. Okay. Action dice. So I mean we do we roll do we roll one? Upon light. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yes, the the I'm trying to remember these rules. First time I'm playing. Each one is a self-contained system which helps you resolve the questions you have the action you want to take. When making an action, go through the following. Draw two cards up from the story deck. So that's the first thing we do. So I'm going to hold them off to the side. So we got one, we got two. Oh, we're not supposed to have jokers in here, so I'm going to I'm going to banish you, joker. Two tens in a row though. A 10 and a 9. Okay. That's pretty high. Um and then uh roll and sum our two action die. So we're going to take our two action die. Wherever our dice are, we're gonna roll them. One, two. <laughs> uh, ooh, okay. Um, and then add any modifiers to get your score. So I'm gonna say we're gonna be patient, right? Um, I don't think it's gonna help us at all, but we are, yeah, we're still gonna be lower than both regardless. Um, but at least, you know, we tried uh, to be patient. So I think Last Wish is really taking a moment to inspect this world um and kind of allow the ancestral memories of the rest of the firelights to pour through them and get an understanding of this alien landscape and, and the emotions that are pouring out um i think too there might be a moment where perhaps um oh that'd be interesting what if like as well um you know like we just woke up after an infinite amount of time from being asleep right so maybe uh maybe um last wish goes to like the edge of the river to like take a drink uh or like to like wipe their their carapace and like depending on what part of the water that you drink or like you wash yourself with like you feel something different you know what i mean maybe you feel um you get a you get the memory of like love and that the feeling of of that love through like another person in this like in this afterlife you know um I don't know if that's going to have any gameplay implications yet, but it is interesting to consider. Uh, okay, so, whoa, breaking everything. Um, then interpret the rules as follows. Uh, if your score is higher than both cards, there's light. That's definitely not the case for our dice. Uh, if your score is higher than one card, nope, there is shade. Otherwise, there is darkness. Um, okay, so I asked, uh, are we alone? Uh, and it says, when you ask the answer, action plus two if likely... Um, but, 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 but I'm going to say action plus one. Oh, wait, interesting. So I'm not going to say it's likely that we're alone. And I'm not going to say, I'm going to say it's just otherwise. Like it could be 50-50, right? So it's a plus one. So if that's the case, I got a six, right? Plus two is eight. Oh, but it has to be higher than both cards. I would tie it for nine. So it's still darkness. Oh, darn it. I thought we were going to get away. Uh, upon darkness, the answer is no. 
And, uh... <laughs> so we're not alone, and it's darkness. So what that sounds like to me <laughs> is maybe we woke up, and the first thing that we see is a curse, right? Unfortunately. Um, maybe that's why... Maybe that explains why the temple is abandoned, and it explains why some of them look smashed. Maybe the curse came to this temple to exterminate all of the firelights to stop there ever being a chance of there being a uh, resurgence of the beacons. Uh, but then I woke up and I start, you know, cleaning my... I imagine, I imagine too, it's a very bug-like... Like, how do I describe bug-like cleaning? You like want to fly, kind of like cleans itself. It's like... It's like, you know, like rubbing its hands against itself and then against its antennas and stuff. I feel like that's what I'm doing. Like, I'm like washing water on my face, but then I'm like rubbing the water like through my mandibles and like through my antenna stalks and like all this stuff. Uh, okay, but there is a curse here. Uh, when you encounter a curse, you may confront them. So there maybe is a chance I could avoid them. Okay, so first of all, let's figure out what kind of curse there is. There's only four options. A calamity, a screecher, a hollow, and a talon. I'll let it be up to random fate. I will roll a d4. It's a one. So that is a calamity. A spider spun from mist who attacks with toxic fumes. Uh, I did design, or design, I did generate some art for this here. Uh, this is a calamity. So it's sort of like this alien spider-like entity made of mist and smoke. Uh, I imagine, too, like, I kind of like that this thing has, like, more legs than a spider should have. I imagine that a calamity that is the same, like, has more, has more than eight legs, uh, and also the legs don't make any, like, symmetrical sense. Like, they could perhaps have an odd amount of legs. Maybe one is, like, growing, like, right out of the center of it, or, like, out of another leg. And so, like, when they walk, it's not, it's not like a concerted movement it's 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 sort of lumbering and awkward and oblong but like it still moves with like a, a swiftness and and a a predatory sort of purpose um which you know is still quite fearsome but it's not just a spider you know what i mean like it's like the sort of alien life form that is composed to be spider-like um Okay, so I'm going to say that, like, as I'm, like, kneeling down by the river, and I'm, like, washing my face, uh, and I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, as I splash the water in my face, it's, like, my mind sort of opens up, and I'm, and I'm treated to a vision of this person's love, and maybe I'm seeing, I imagine I'm seeing maybe, like, from the first person view, I'm seeing someone, like, run through a yard, like, a forest, with like creatures that are like it but smaller uh, and they're laughing and they're giggling and they're chasing each other and they're like playing tag and they're like climbing trees or like whatever the plants would be um and sort of um scraping their knees and you know then we sort of pick them up from first person and we're like rubbing rubbing their scraped knee and we're like you know putting salve on it it's sort of like this very familial love it's sort of like caring for a child kind of thing uh but as like the vision kind of ends uh, we're looking down into the water and we can see our reflection in the pool, right? And behind us, we can see the reflection of the temple, right? That's like standing starkly into the night. And then from the reflection of the water of the temple, we see this spindly, gaseous, like sinewy leg sort of drape itself over top of the top of the temple and then another and then another and then lumbering over the top of the structure, you know, we begin to see the body of this massive uh, being of legs and fangs and fumes begin to uh, crawl its way to the top of the temple. We see that <laughs> and we immediately bolt, I think, um, behind um, one of the statues, right? And we like clutch our staff closely to us. And I think we sort of share this, uh, spiritual connection to our staff. So th the staff knows that we are in danger and we want to hide. So almost intrinsically, like the, the lantern light sort of burns down and gets smaller, smaller and smokier and darker until like, uh, it is just sort of like a, a, a crumbling ember in the basin of our staff. And the same thing, like our, our, our sort of our, um, 
our bioluminescent markings also sort of like fade down uh and so we're like huddled behind the statue with our like uh our, our muted staff trying to avoid the the creature okay so i think what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to avoid the creature uh when you avoid an impending threat we take an action and an approach um i'm going to say uh i'm going to say oh boy um I'm going to say the creature has not seen us yet. I guess I guess I could write I guess I could ask the oracle if I'm going to be super if I'm going to really put the rules to the test, right? Uh Yeah, let's let's ask the oracle. So, hey oracle, has the calamity seen us yet? <laughs> uh all right. So, I'm going to and I'll use quickness for this. Because I dashed behind the stone, right? So, all right, here's the two dice. I'm sorry, the two cards. A five and a king. Oh, kings are worth 13. That also sucks because the kings, the face cards would have been a beacon if the creature wasn't there. So now that means the be one of the beacons is even later in our explorations, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, okay, so then we... I don't think there's going to be a chance I can get higher than the king's dice, but I can at least try and get higher than the five. Uh, okay. Um, so, to interpret the... If your score is higher than both cards, there's light. If the score is higher than one card, there's shade. So, an eight is higher than a five. Uh, oh, and then plus I'd add my one. So, a nine is higher than a five. So, I actually got... I rolled eight, uh, nine twice. Um... So, what does that mean? If I get shade, the answer is yes, but. <laughs> so, it does see me, but what is the but? The but could be... It does see me, but. Hmm. What, what obstacle could be in the way of the creature... Hmm. Maybe. Okay. Okay. Here's what's going to happen. Um, the curse, you know, sees us. <laughs> we're, we're hiding behind the thing. We, like, peek around our head to, like, see if, if the curse is still lurking on top of the temple. And um, we see, like, it, it just sort of, like, cranes up on its, like, hindquarters and stretches some of its legs up into the air almost as if like it's um uh, almost like if it's stretching itself into the in up towards the sky in some sort of strange communion right like it's just sort of wavering back and forth for a moment just sort of shifting back and forth and we're being dead silent uh because we don't want to attract any attention to ourselves uh and there you know there's sort of like a moment of like pitch silence and suddenly there's a <sighs> there's like a, a big sort of wisp of smoke and um air as the creature disappears and we we like hunker down again <laughs> and we're like uh, you know wondering what happens and then like really close but like on the other side of the statue there's another explosion of gas and mist um as a bunch of these long sinewy legs explode out for it and reach toward us uh and we immediately leap backward right and we, uh, we, we like leap back towards the river and the creature sort of uses half, like half of it is like the spider power of being able to crawl on virtually anything. Half of it, I just think is it's, it's raw weight and it's strength. It is the calamity, uh, sort of pushes down and crushes some of the statue. Uh, I think I'm now officially going to put on some more dramatic, uh, some more dramatic music to fit our current vibe. Um, it's half of the weight uh, just sort of crushes and smashes the statue. Uh, the rest of it sort of crawls over it as it's leap leaping toward us. But as we like shift backwards and we tighten our grip around our staff, uh, you know, some of the fire <laughs> burns back into the firelight. Um, ooh, okay. All right, track. Doing it big. Um, turn it down a little bit. Uh, in my headphones, actually. But I do like this track. This is fitting. Um, sort of nearing us we take a step back towards the water right uh and like our our feet touches the water and um 
as the as the the curse gets close to us it like it gets like one leg in the into the river and then there's almost like sort of a, an acidic sound like a tss, and the water begins to bubble and boil underneath the creature's leg as it reaches upward and sort of screeches you know and like pulls backward um because this this knowledge this this understanding of love and the and the secrets of the the once living right um the the curses hate that the curses are trying to destroy that the curses are trying to devour hope and and knowledge and and the chance of resurrection so i think there's sort of like this uh antithetical presence as soon as the the calamity touches it it sort of burns away at, at its ethereal flesh its form and it sort of retreats back so we're in the water so i think that is the yes but it sees us but we're at somewhat of an advantage because we are not harmed by the memories like the creature is and so we can maybe use that to our advantage to help us escape uh that is how i'm narratively justifying that hopefully that makes sense um so now i guess that means we still have a chance to try to evade it uh i don't really know how the but helps us that mechanically speaking i don't see anything written in the rules um like temporary bonuses um because of situational aspects like for example the fact that the creature um does not like being in contact with the the emotions of love um but perhaps we can just we can rule we can we can make something up maybe we can give one of our dice uh, an extra re-roll or something or an extra plus something because you know we sort of discovered a little secret against it um but regardless we do have to try to escape him uh so i'm gonna draw two more cards bum bum oh the jack the jacks are worth 11 okay so we're definitely only going to get shade here is what i'm i'm reading from this um but let's find out so i'm gonna use quickness again which is a plus one i'm gonna roll twice one two i'm gonna re-roll that one so i got a five plus my one for quickness which is a six so i'm higher than only one of the results so if i'm evading danger when you avoid an impending threat um upon light you avoid the danger upon shade mark one fatigue if there's darkness mark two fatigue okay so what i think that means is that we don't avoid it because it doesn't say we avoided the danger right very very specifically we would have to have light to avoid it so i think that does mean we find danger and we have to mark a fatigue okay so one two three four five uh oh boy the this game's starting off with a with a bang <laughs> the first thing we do <laughs> all right so i'm gonna can i like copy some of this stuff into this here okay so we have we have last wish first thing we do is we come out of the temple and we find ourselves face to face with a calamity can I put them side by side? That'd be really cool if I could. <laughs> what if I, what if I, what if I, oh no. What did I do? Don't look at the NPCs yet. <laughs> I broke everything. No, I didn't. I just have to put it in a different uh, box. There we go. Bet you if I do this. There you go. Beautiful. Oh my gosh. Did anyone just see my cat jump on me? Honey. <laughs> that scared the life out of me. See, that's what happens when she... <laughs> that scared the life out of me. That's what happens. I tell her not to climb on top of the desk because it's too tall for her. It's too tall for you, and you know that. And then you get stuck up there, and then I get into something, and you try to get down on your own. And you use me as a springboard. Spider baby, spider mist. That's what it felt like. Jeez, my heart is like in my chest right now. That was so scary. What? Next time, just meow. No one heard her, like, meow loudly, right? Like, for help. Just meow, baby. I would have helped you. Oh, my God. My... That... Oh. I can't wait to clip this. <laughs>
Oh no. Oh, it's going to be so embarrassing. <laughs> but I don't even care. Oh, do it. Do it. It's it's any, anything for content 2023, right? Holy hell though. She really did just like fall right on top of me. <sighs> okay, heart is in my 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 throat. I'm going to loop it put on Benny Hill music. Oh my god, that was terrifying. Okay, anyway, back to this game. So now we have one fatigue of five, which is not great. Uh, one of five. But what's probably worse is now that we're, we're facing, uh, we're, we're step face to face with a calamity here. Um, which is, you know, uh, not the best situation that we could be in. So now we have to understand the rules for fighting. So fighting a curse. When you confront a curse, we take an action and an approach to hurt it. Repeat until you've stacked enough cards to match the curse's strength. Um, so once again, we choose the approach. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps we, we do a quick first. We want to try, I think we see the curse get burnt by the, the river. And we understand that we can use that to our advantage. But from where our current position... This thing can definitely reach out and just grab us if it needed to. Um, oh, interesting. It takes us back upon darkness, evade danger. Oh, in case I see confront risk. Interesting. So fight, curse, and evade danger kind of loop back into each other as far as um, events are concerned. Interesting. Okay. So I think, yeah, I think what we're going to do is we, we, we recognize that uh, this creature does not like the water, does not like the, the, the flow of emotions that, that pour out from all the directions. And we're going to try to use that to our advantage. So we have our, our staff, and I think we, um, we hold it forward. Um, and, you know, I think the flame burns brighter. And the same thing, the, the flame is a, is a, a symbol of the the world being sort of reborn right so i think similarly uh the calamity doesn't like that and so it rears up on all of its legs uh, as we like slowly take a few steps back as we're trying to get like kind of deeper into the water um and i think uh in the back of our minds we hear another voice uh and this time it is not the protector's voice right it is it is a different voice it is a dark sinister it is a it is a voice that is filled with malice and contempt, um, and uh, and it and it's not quite coming. It, it, it how do I describe it? It's coming from the calamity. It's in my mind. I know that it's coming from the calamity, but it is not the calamity's voice, right? It is another presence, perhaps equal in strength to the protector's voice. Um, but the opposing force of it, and it is only using the proximity of the calamity to me as like a vessel, right? As like a, as like a sounding board for its for its aims, um, and uh, it sort of whispers it in the corner of my mind, "You were born into darkness. You will die in darkness. Your quest, your journey, all for naught. Firelight." I will extinguish thy flame if I must. And then, you know, the, the creature, like, lurches forward. Um, okay, so we need to... We need to fl draw two cards. And we need to flip. An eight and a five. Okay, there's a chance that we could we could be better. Um, I'm going to roll twice. Bah, bah. Okay. Then I I said quick, so we got a, what do you call it, a one, so this is a 12, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, ugh, we're still short, we're still short, but we're still higher than one, so if we are fighting a curse and there's shade, stack one of the cards on the curse, okay. A spider spun from mist who attacks with toxic fumes. Red cards, which this is a red card. Whoa. Uh, counts as two stacks. 
If you encounter a curse, build a stack of cards as described in the fight a curse action. When the number of cards, the stack matches the curse of strength. Okay, so not the not the number on the card, but the number of cards. Okay. So it has five strength, meaning we need to we need to get five cards on it, but red cards count twice, right? Uh, so what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to put a bunch of these over here. Because these are all discarded. And I will actually use this new stack. So we have two red cards on the Calamity. We need five cards to defeat it. Um, so we got lucky that one of them was red, actually. Um, so yeah, in our minds, we hear it say, like, I will extinguish thy flame if I must. And it, like, lurches forward. Uh, and we draw back uh, and we... Uh, sort of thrust forward with our staff, um, and the creature, the flame, like, we try to plant the staff right into its belly, uh, but because it's, like, made of mist, it just sort of separates in parts, like, it creates a hole in its body, and just sort of separates into smoke all around the staff, like, our, our strike moving forward, uh, and then it just kind of shifts by us, and as, like, the, um, the, the smoke pushes through us uh, we inhale some of it and we can feel the noxious poisonous uh nature of the creature it gets inside of our uh, uh, well our mandibles our nostrils however we breathe and you know it sort of burns at our insides <coughs> and like stings our eyes uh as the creature then uh as a as a pile of mist forms behind us and takes its form once again tries to tries to swipe at us uh but we leap out of the way we like tuck and roll towards the water as it plunges its hand it's one of its clawed uh, appendages into the water and once again there is a explosion of um sort of steaming water as the creature is once again scalded by the river <sighs> and like lurches backward um so that is two successes on defeating the calamity so we stack one um okay so fighting a curse uh, I guess we I guess we just have to keep doing the same thing there, right? Okay. Um so let's draw another two cards. So these are our two successes. One, two. And then we flip, bump, bump. Okay, okay, okay. I like the odds of this. Um So once again, I think um I think we learned that we're not gonna beat this thing through brute force. So perhaps quickness is not... I mean, uh, sorry, force is not our best bet. Um, mm, but what if we... What if we... Okay, what if we use our patience in that we, like, we see... Like, we take a step backward and we can feel... We feel our foot slip, you know? Suddenly the water is no longer at our ankles or something. It almost dips down past our calves and our knees and we understand that we are standing on the very edge of a deep, deep riverbank, right? Um, and perhaps if we're if we are if we are keen enough, we can draw this creature into the depths. Uh, if we are, so I'm going to say we're going to use patience on this one. We are sort of biding our time. We're sort of uh, we're sort of trying to sell as if the water is, is not as deep as it is. As we sort of spin our, our staff and hold it back towards the the being and just sort of hold our ground. And you can hear that sort of wicked laugh in the back of, of, of our minds as the creature sort of like wheels around on all of its lopsided legs and like narrows its focus back on us. Um, so brave to be born so nearly, but just as foolish. The firelights are dead. They are not but embers. And you shall be Ash that joins them on the pile. As it begins to like skitter towards us uh, with another laugh in its e in our ear. Uh, we're going to roll our die. Bum, bum. Okay. Uh, so that actually defeats both, right? Um, five to seven. We did patience, which is plus two. So that's even higher. That's a nine. Um, so if we check our fight of curse upon light, which is both cards are high. Stack two cards on the curse, and we know that red cards count as two. So if that's the case, one card, two card, 
we stack the other card. One, two, three, four, five. I think that's a dead calamity. So I think what happens is it like reaches for us and says, you will join them on the pile. And like, as it like lurches towards us, we actually like lean backward and we just put like the staff across our chest and we like go to like lay down just to like fall into the water. And the creature lurches at us, right? And thinks like, you know, I can see like its fangs. It's like misshapen, um, ethereal sort of spirit fangs. Um, <laughs> eaten by ghost spiders is another theme that this uh, stream has apparently. Uh, lurches towards us. Uh, but as we like fall backward, it kind of like overshoots its shot. And it, uh, you know, the, the smoke and the steam is like wheeling out from behind it. And you can see it tries to put its legs down to ready itself but realizes all too late that the its legs go far deeper than it anticipated right it doesn't touch the bottom of the river it keeps sinking and it goes head first uh into the river uh and it releases this un unfathomable wail this like screech that sort of sunders you know the corners of our minds as it like flips up into the water and you know that like horrible things that bugs do when they're dying they like, they flip up on their back and their legs just go crazy in all directions uh that is what happens to this thing but like as the water is boiling and you know there's like steam coming off of it and the smoke that it is made out of is like dissipating and it's releasing those acrid fumes we have to like throw our our, uh, our cloak over our face for a moment to like shield ourselves uh, from the, the pungent, noxious uh, air that this creature is, is releasing. Um, but with every moment, as it's like twitching and its legs are flying, um, it's getting smaller and smaller as more of the smoke is like dissipating and it is being like evaporated by the spiritual energy of this river. Uh, and there's like those horrible screeches, but then also the voice in the back of our minds. Uh, and says, uh, just sort of like endlessly berating us and sort of a snickering in our ear. Um, this is not the end, Firelight. I am but one of many. We are Legion, and we are coming for you. And sort of like the creature continues to like shriek and shift until the smoke completely engulfs it, uh, and like a big wind, a rush of wind like swings by. Uh, and then as we like sort of train our eyes back where the creature was, the calamity has been completely dissipated and there is nothing but a river, which is once again, lazily pouring the emotions down, uh, through to the rest of Penumbra. And so I think that finally finishes our last, or I should say our first, uh, event, um, so wow what an exciting thing to wake up to <laughs> we like literally just cracked out of our cocoon and was almost eaten by a ghost spider sick 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 uh you know no uh no uh moment of rest for the firelights um i think um with that done we take a moment to collect ourselves we we take a look at like um any injuries we might have endured, they aren't physical, I think, but I think our stomach is, like, retching and our eyes burn and our and our veins almost feel coag coagulated with, like, some sort of corruption, right? Like, we breathe in, it's poison. And so I think we feel sickly, uh, which describes our, our um, fatigue. Um, but, you know, at least we weren't <laughs> forcibly uh, uh, ripped apart or eaten or whatever that thing would have done to us had it been successful. Um... And so, you know, we take stock, uh, and I want to see the other options we have here. We can't buy information until we have treasures. Maybe we should search for some treasures, you know? That's kind of fun. Uh, I don't really know what that means for us yet, but that sounds like it'd be a cool thing. Uh, so let's search for treasures. When you search for something lost, actually, yeah, I think we're just looking for anything that's going to be helpful. You know what I mean? Something that is going to... We, we are, are coughing and sputtering on um sickness and i think we're just trying to find anything in this area that might help us before we set off so let's take a look here we're gonna go back to our uh cards we're gonna flip we're gonna flip okay seems like we could probably do and i'm gonna say this is patient you know we're not in a rush we just defeated the monster 
Um, so we can, I think, take our time on this and we can roll two dice. Oh, nice. Okay, so uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got a 12, so we're higher than both. Upon light, we find two treasures. So what does treasures mean in this instance? Oh, I should say, I should um, <laughs> type up what happens here. Um, we find out that, oh, we find a calamity, uh, which is a spider made of poisonous mist. Um, and realize, I realize, I can't type, um, that the uh, rivers of emotion coming from beneath the temple um, are antithetical <laughs> to this being's nature and harms it. Um, we also hear a disembodied voice speaking through the calamity. Uh, we use wits and speed to lure the creature into a deep portion of the river. And as it lunges, we force it into the water and cause it to boil and dissipate. Nice. Very cool. Um, but what are treasures in a world like this? I think what happens is I, oh my neck, ooh, did you hear that? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I think I, I think Last Wish uh, begins to comb through. Uh, I think I think the statue actually that the that the creature broke right because this is like the first um, this is the first creature. This is the first statue that we were able to get like really up close and personal with because the creature toppled it over, right? And it's like on the banks of the river. And so we're inspecting the statue and we take a look towards its face, which, one, which once again doesn't hold a lot of discerning features, but you can see like, you know, the carve, like the rough carving of like a humanoid visage upon it. And we can see that there are like two hollowed out slits, like holes, like where the eyes of, of a creature would be. And I think in their corners, we think we see something glistening, right? And so we reach forward and we pluck out uh, two gemstones, which are teardrop shaped. And they're sort of like crystallized, they're sort of like crystallized waters of the estuary. So like if you look at them too long, or especially like if you run them underwater, um, you begin to see, well, if you, if you look at them, I'll say this, if you look at them, you'll start seeing the reflection of the memory of love within the teardrops. But if you like dip them into the water or any water, uh, then you experience the emotion. Um, like like uh, we did when we bathed in the water, right? So the treasure is sort of like a physical treasure. It is like a gem. Uh, so it has value in that sense, but it also has sort of a more uh, abstract value because there, there are like emotions and like memories trapped within it. So that's going to be our, our treasure. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, we find in the hollowed out, in the hollowed out eyes of a statue to teardrop gems which hold the memories of loved ones within them um uh, gazing into it reveals a memory uh, and then washing the stone helps you experience it okay that's cool i think it's pretty neat i think it's neat <laughs> um and so from there, all right, I don't think there's much else to do. Uh, I don't, I want to say here, there's probably no place to buy information. Um, you know, uh, I think we're the only thing here. The only thing that was, other thing here was a calamity. Uh, so I think we're going to discover a region. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna start exploring. Uh, so when we look for a new path, 
Action plus approach to expand your map and then roll on the table for inspiration. Uh, okay, so same thing. We're gonna go back here. So I think, yeah, we uh, discard these. We take a look at the 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 roiling uh, a waste of the calamity which is withered away a withered husk in the water uh we now see that the temple is pretty much not of no use to us and is also no longer safe because whatever whatever vile force is trying to extinguish the chance of of um rebirth in this world uh it's it was setting us up to fail uh and so we know that we can't stay here and we have to go so we are going to take two cards we are going to flip them both. Ooh, a queen is going to be... Oh, and that's a face card that could have been a beacon. Wow, it really hurts. It really hurts when you when you don't get a beacon. I'll say that much. Uh, okay, so we're going to roll two dice. I'm going to say once again, we're being patient. Um, we have all the time in the world, as far as we know, or in Penumbra, <laughs> to, to travel. So I'm going to say we got 10. Um, so we're higher than one of the cards which means we can add one of the cards to our map. Uh, one of the cards or a, one of the cards to your map. Okay. Um, yeah, right? When you discover a region, action plus approach, one of the, because this is one of the ones that we drew. Oh, so we can add, we can add the queen. We can, we can get, we can use the queen. Okay. Um, now, I want to read exploring the map. When you add a new region card, the corner of your card needs to connect with another region's corner. To know whether the region you're adding is located below, beside, or above the current location, compare the numbers of both cards and interpret the result. If the number on the new card is higher than the one in your current location, place it above. Um, so it is above. So when it says corner, do you think they mean it has to add a stack on top like this, like the path is straight? Or if it's corner to corner, so things are like, you know, like um, diagonal, catty corner. Because some things get added next to, right? Um, so place it below in the corner. Maybe corner? Because that way if things end up going beside, they can fill in gaps. Maybe? Uh Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, okay. I'm going to say... Corner for now. But I am going to take the queen. Because... And this is where the Metroidvania thing comes into play. Because now... Um, I'm just sorting through these cards to make sure they're all face down. Not that it really matters. Um, but now, because if we never have to come back here, then we'd have to deliver someone to one of the beacons, so it'd be this place. Okay, so cool. Um, but we can add a new location. So we have the Queen of Clubs. That one's clubs. I know. Queen of Clubs. My cards. Um, so this is a beacon. Huzzah! All right, uh, now, that's kind of lucky. We've got an early beacon. Uh, now let's take a look at our rules to see what this zone on the map looks like. Um, oof, my, my heart and soul. Um, we're going to go with, uh, one, two, so a four and a five. So we got a four and a five. It's a wasteland. Okay. Okay. Uh, I guess that makes sense. It's it's it is it is a beacon, but it's the nearest one to the temple, which has like been destroyed and like a husk. So perhaps that like corruption is leading out. So it's a wasteland. Uh, but what is the what is the sentiment? What is the emotion happening here? What is the descriptor? The theme? Uh, one, two, four, and a three, four, three. A, w a wasteland of redemption. I mean, it makes sense. Because we are redeeming, uh, we are redeeming this place. Uh, a wasteland of redemption, huh? Okay, so what does that mean? Um, oh, and there's also an event. Hmm. Interesting. Um. Hmm. 
Let's 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 settle the let's settle the let's settle the location first. So what is a wasteland of redemption? So I think I I I I take my leave of the temple and I start following one of the rivers. Uh actually no, I there's a, there was a there was a bridge that led out to the temple over the basin. So I'm assuming there's probably a road or at least the remains of a road that lead from the uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, from the temple uh, to the rest of Penumbra. So I'm gonna follow that road. I'm gonna follow it for a while. And I can see, you know, there's, I think as I'm viewing the landscape, um, I'm, I'm sort of flooded with the memories of the other firelights before me, and I can sort of see almost mirror images, like fuzzy faded mirror images of what once was during the height of our existence and like during a, a peaceful penumbra when the veil was, was not threatened. And... You know, it's still ethereal and otherworldly and, and sort of alien, but it's dreamlike. There's something comforting about it. The the colors are um, sort of warm and they're psychedelic almost, and they're they they inspire sort of like a, a fuzziness in the heart and the mind and and like inspiration. Um, you know, sort of like it it at once walking through Penumbra felt almost meditative. You know, like you were experiencing sort of like a cosmic peace uh, outside of yourself. But now everything is dark and everything is jagged and everything is cold. And instead of a dream, it sort of has become like a, a waking nightmare. Um, and that is reflected in the landscape. It is all twisted and, and corrupted. And um, we can see, so I'm sort of intrinsically, I know that this path is, you know, the first beacon. It would have been one of the first beacons that, that a firelight could use to leave right from the temple to find the path to like lead the dead onward. Um, but when I approach, so it's a wasteland, I imagine this, it's a field, right? And I imagine it's a wasteland of redemption. Redemption is such a heavy, heavy word. Um, what I see is there's this field, right? And there are these massive poles, these like stone obelisks that um, are rising out of the ground. And some of them are still like straight and like standing proudly. Others have been falling askew, uh, whether that's because of time or um, interference from other beings or sabotage or things like that. I think some too. I think I think also the world is like kind of actively destabilizing, and so there are chunks of the terrain and the stone, um, and especially like the stone obelisks that like have fractured off and like still sort of float lazily and like drift, you know, throughout the world on, on kind of its own accord, um, and so. And some and some of that feels like it's the result of just um, the veil kind of thinning and and penumbra being being attacked from the inside. Um, but I see these obelisks, right? And there's a vision of me who can see this um, in its like at its like height, you know. And I can see the warmth, the dreamlike state of this field, uh, and I can see there are souls that would wander to these obelisks. And the obelisks have have writing on them, and like murals and hieroglyphics, like the temple did. Um, but these aren't depicting scenes or moments of history from like the firelights and like from the temple. The the obelisks are reflecting um, the stories and events of people's lives. It's almost like a recounting in the stone, right, to forever be marked. And each obelisk. Um, you know, tales, tales of people um, who both have, like, committed terrible deeds or have wronged someone or wronged themselves, um, but then have realized their, their wrongdoings or have realized their, their failings and their falsehoods and have taken corrective action to better themselves and to better the world they left behind and to, 
to to make good on their lives while they were living still you know um and so they're sort of forever emblazoned and etched across the stone, you know, presumably for other spirits to maybe see at one point and be inspired by or, or to find solace in, especially if their st story. I imagine there's probably some sort of like spiritual echolation where like any spirit who would approach any obelisk would probably be treated to their story, you know, at the time. Um, but a lot of that magic is like waning or like broken now that the place is so corrupted. Um... But, you know, so there's all these obelisks, um, and then in the center of this massive field, this, like, wasteland, which, once again, um, was probably once lush and, like, filled with, like, um, you know, like, foliage and, like, you know, like, soft grass for, like, the spirits to, like, lay in and, like, relax and, like, feel the 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 glory of their, their, their redemption arcs, their stories, like, you know... Um, um bring them peace i think now it's like dust and stone and gravel and it's harsh um and it's you know sort of reflective of a place of like no, where nobody wants to rest where you're not supposed to rest here anymore you're not supposed to find peace here um but i think in the center of all of this there is like this raised platform right it has like a big staircase leading up on like either side through the valley um, and in it, there is a uh, massive um, a brazier, 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 I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. You know, one of those giant like metallic um, cauldrons where one would start a fire. Um, and it, of course, is empty. There's probably like some... There's probably, I imagine, like the husks of trees in there. I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to nerd out a little bit. I'm going to say they're birch trees. Uh, I love birch trees because, well, I had like a big one growing in my backyard when I was a kid. But like, I like to read about like metaphysical stuff and like spooky magical stuff. And like birch trees in like a lot of uh, schools of thought are represented of like cleansing and like healing and rebirth, right? Um which I think is like very on brand for um, a beacon light, like a, a fire beacon that has to like lead the souls back to their to their resting places. Um, so I imagine there's probably like these like these huge, you know, l not logs, but like entire like trees, uh, you know, just the, like their tops chopped off um, of like birch trees, like in the basin of the the beacon. Um, but no matter how many trees are there, they never like burn out. You know, they're like ever burning. If a fire can be lit upon them, if a fire lights light can be burnt upon them, then it burns forever, right? But like, um, so it can't like be used up. Uh, and I imagine the trees too probably have like some, um, some markings carved into them, you know, some ancient magic that is like written across the wood, um, that like binds them to this plane, all that stuff. Whether or not we can read it is another question. Uh, but like, yeah, the, th the overall theming here is if we light it on fire, uh, we don't have to worry about like rekindling it. It's, it's always there. Um, but it's just the fact that, um, oh, what's the word? My brain. Um, that it has to be ignited from the firelight. Um, and so now we got to figure out, is there, is there something happening here? Confront the risk. When you act in the face of adversity, action plus approach. Um, okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to ask a lot of questions here. Um, I mean, I'm assuming there's probably some challenge for us to be able to relight the the ba, 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 the fire um so i'm gonna say maybe confront risk and when you act in the face of adversity so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna gingerly approach <laughs> the beacon um and we are going to see we're gonna let the dice tell us maybe what the challenge will be for us or what the challenge will oh did not want to do that um what the what the story will tell us so we're going to draw two cards we're gonna flip two a six and a seven uh once again i think we're not in a rush to figure out how to do this this is our, our purpose this is our point so we will be patient and we will be careful 
Um, oof. Okay. So a seven. So we're higher than one of the cards. Shade. It's a partial success. Okay. All right. So what I think happens here. I was, I was, I kind of had a feeling that was going to be the case. And I want to build upon this Metroidvania theme, right? Uh, this whole idea of like walking back and rediscovering and like all this stuff. Oh, um, ah, eh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll give it a moment. We'll give it a moment. Um, um, we walk up to the, the, to the beacon and we take our staff and we hold it down towards the basin of the of the birch wood the like the ever burning birch wood that lies at the at its foot and you know there's sort of that there's um this fire almost thinks for itself it knows it's getting closer to the beacon and so it's beginning to grow in intensity almost excitedly like it wants to be rejoined with the beacon uh, and so we lean our staff down towards the birch wood and there's a leap of fire, like a moat that just rips right out of the staff and like lands into the birch wood. And there's a sort of an excited, whoosh, you know, that like stretches out almost immediately. But as it streaks across like the white hull of the wood and begins to illuminate some of the coals underneath, um, the fire can't really grow much higher than like a low bluish, a bl you know, bluish rumble, barely only rising. Oh, I mean, the fire's massive compared to us. I mean, like it's, it, the, the fire is the size of a building, but like, you know, if we were talking about a smaller fire, like the, the, the flames can hardly reach like an inch off of the wood. This is not the big roiling fire <laughs> i keep saying roiling roiling is like one of those words like when i'm dungeon master or i'm storytelling where once i say it once i can't stop saying it because it's like an interesting word and it, just to me everything now is roiling roiling and boiling um but yeah it's not quite catching it's not quite um creating the full plume of fire that we need for the light to the for the beacon to light um and i think we're confused and we're a little crestfallen um, because we, you know, this is why we're here and we found the thing and we've done what we've supposed to do, but it's not working. And then, you know, we hear a voice, the comforting voice, the voice of the protectors kind of echo back into our mind. Uh, and it says, last wish, you have found your way to the first beacon. You were brave and you are to be rewarded. But the fires have gone cold for a long time. It will take a great breath of life to bring them to their full power. The beacons are meant to shepherd the souls of the lost to the other side, and it has not helped ferry a soul for eons and epochs. Go, search for a soul in need, return them to the beacon, and through their union will this fire be lit, and part of your path completed. And like, the voice leaves us, and we are, you know, whoosh, we snap back into reality, whoop, there goes gravity. Um, and so this gives us kind of like an objective now, you know? that's in universe uh, we have to light the beacons but to light a beacon unless we're unsuccessful right uh if we are if we're only partially successful in lighting a beacon it's because we need the fuel of a soul that is crossing over to help light it um and i think that'll help give us some push and pull with the narrative here all right so the wasteland of redemption uh, a massive field of shadow mist rocky stone and gravel devoid of life or comfort um obelisks dot the valley uh inscrawled with stories oh is that even a word did i just make that up <laughs> uh scrawled with stories uh, of people's lives 
their um, failings, misgivings, and eventual paths of redemption. Um, uh, though, though the obelisks are in a state of grave disrepair. Um, and uh, uh, we, we attempt to light the beacon, to light the beacon, uh, which is uh, a massive hoisted brazier on a staircase um, filled with ever burning uh, and enchanted birch wood. But oh no, we cannot light the flame. Um, we are told by the protectors that we need uh, to help bring a soul to pass on to the other side if we hope to light the beacons. There we go. Perfect. All right. So I guess if that's the case, maybe we look around. Maybe we ask the Oracle. Maybe there are we alone, right? Um, here. <laughs> and perhaps there's a soul here. Um, okay. So first things first. Um, are we are we alone here at the at the basin? Oh great and mighty oracle. Let's grab two. Flip flip. Okay. And then let's do two dice. Um, I'm just gonna once again stick with patient. Uh six, seven, eight. Okay, so then we're higher than both. Uh Oh, I said, are we alone? Yes, and uh, I guess I guess the question is, is there someone else here? Yes, and okay, and um, yes, and are they a spirit? <laughs> um, so then, let's see here. There's also this buy information thing, which is interesting. When you trade treasures for knowledge, decide a number of treasures. Uh, yeah, okay, so yes and, let me read this again. Oh, and then I add, yeah. No, I still would've gotten higher regardless. Upon darkness, the answer is no. So is there a spirit here? Yes and, higher than both. Okay. I think, I think the, I, the I'm getting positive vibes from light, full light, right? It should be a spirit. So now what we can do, is let's take a look. There's actually a, a, a role here for different types of people, different types of stories. Um, so why don't we, first of all, take a look at the, the type of person we're dealing with here. A one and a three is a thief. <laughs> a thief. Okay, so the soul of a thief. Interesting. Um, so the soul of a thief. Interesting that they're here at the beacons of redemption. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, no, 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 we got, there's some stuff brewing. There's some stuff cooking for sure. Uh, and then let's also roll something for the event. I don't know what it's gonna mean yet, but um, it's gonna mean something cool. So a one and a five, it's pursuing. Yes, of course, it is pursuing redemption, of course. Um, uh, so let's take this, um, soul of a thief, um, pursuing is the action. Yeah, why would it come here to the obelisks, uh, if not to try and, um, find some form of redemption? Um, okay. Hmm. Interesting. A thief. Okay. There's. I'm gonna have to roll a couple of things. I think I should have had a. Um. Oh, you know, what? I can. I can open up one. I'm on the outside tab. I should have like a fantasy name generator. You know, just ready to go. Uh, just in case we we need one. Um. 
Yeah, we'll say human. Why not? Um, and <laughs> I, they're giving me the most complicated fantasy name generator sites. I didn't think we, I don't know. It's interesting. I didn't think we'd find a find a spirit so quick. Um, okay, so this one will work. These ones seem pretty like varied. Uh, Soul of a Thief. So last wish is going to, um, you know, I think there's maybe like the uh, shifting sound behind him, uh, behind them. And I think, you know, uh, Last Wish is very skittish considering the last time there was something behind him. It was a giant spider composed of mist and poison. Uh, and so uh, Last Wish sort of wheels around, spins the staff uh, in their hands, and then aims it downward as the flame like <sighs> like burns bright. And there's like a shadow that kind of flickers at the corner of his vision and like gets behind one of the obelisks. And uh, whatever the equivalent of narrowing the eyes for a bug mantis person happens behind um, Last Wish's hood uh, and says, You cannot hide from me, Shadow. I have seen you. You hide from me, but you are not hidden. Reveal yourself, and you may yet still find mercy. Um, and there's like a, there's a moment of silence. You can hear like another sort of shift of footfalls. Um, and then craning from the other side, let's roll. Let's do what we do for um, Notorious and just sort of random roll um, some pronouns. Okay, so we're going to say... Hmm... A lady, a lady spirit. And I'll take one of these names. Okay, so wheeling out from behind the pillar is the form of a woman. Um, she is, she's a spirit, so she's not fully corporeal. She's probably, you know, somewhat intangible, somewhat see-through. Um, part of her sort of mingles with the mists in a way that is like hard for you to tell if she's actually there or not, or if she's a figment of your imagination. Um, but we train our eyes hard enough and our sort of supernatural or otherworldly senses. We are a firelight. Our purpose is to guide spirits. So we are probably much better than most at detecting spirits um, in this realm. And we finally narrow our, our, our senses on her. Um, she has sort of like a, 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 a thick, um, what's the word, uh, thick mane of dark hair. Um, you can see she's sort of wearing, um, very simple, dingy, uh, clothes, probably like a dark hood and cloak, which is like, she doesn't have it up. It's like, at, you know, pulled down, um, and like some really like kind of hard scrabble leathers and tunic. Um, she does not look like sort of the kind of thief that comes from like high society and pulls like, you know, death defying major jobs. We're talking about a thief who looks like, um, does it to like very much survive um, and probably for their own personal gain, just like get through the next day. Um, and um, sort of slowly wheels her way from around the obelisk and sort of locks eyes on us, and there is like a sort of a, a, a strange, a sad, a hollowness um, in her in her countenance. Um, and she, I think she's just as confused. I you know the firelights have been gone for so long, and the veil has been so plagued by the this darkness that perhaps the spirit has not been in the veil since the firelights have been around. You know. So she looks at us uh, and sort of very nervously, she, she, she knows she's, are you one of them? One of who? I, I don't know what you call them, the, the creatures, they, they hunt us, they stalk us, the, some call them curses. Are you a curse? She sort of like tries to inflate herself a bit before us. Um, and I think we sort of, like, tilt our head to the side. I am no curse. 
I am the last wish. I am a friend to you, I would hope, if you would wish to be a friend to me. And I like s slowly like pull my staff back uh, to sort of, you know, try to disincentivize any harsh feelings. Um, and she, you know, looks at us puzzled. You're the last wish? Not sure what that means. Uh, and all we can really do is honestly shrug our shoulders. It is what this one is called. It is the name that it awoke with. I kind of like maybe saying like it, like it's a part of the fire. Like, yeah, I like the idea that yeah, what 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 is that recent Mass Effect, the Hanar, where they're always like, this one says, this one does, because they have like a hive mind, kind of. I kind of like that idea. It's going to be hard to keep in the back of my brain, uh, but I'll try it. Um, uh, this one has only known that it is called Last Wish, for it was born with that word in its mind, imprinted upon it, in a way. I am here to help you and others like you who are trapped here who hurt you do hurt do you not um and the thief sort of looks around uh mochi says like the borg in star trek yeah exactly although a lot more chill <laughs> the firelights are a lot more chill i imagine but yes um and um to the to the question like do you hurt uh, I think the thief looks towards one of the obelisks and, like, puts her hand upon the stone. Um, and there's definitely, like, a sort of a wave of, of, um, of acknowledgement and sadness that sort of flows through her. And, uh, she says, my body doesn't, not anymore. I don't feel anything on the outside but and she's like narrowing her eyes like at the obelisk itself like trying to find something that isn't there i hurt i've hurt for a long time um and so last wish kind of begins to take a few steps forward very tenderly very like you know doesn't want to spook her or anything um this one has told you its name yet it still does not know yours. Please, enlighten it. Um, and the thief finally looks back to us. Um, and there's a bit of a reticence, but, you know, definitely... There, you know, I think also, even though a soul has not dealt with a firelight in a very long time, there is sort of, like, an intrinsic understanding. Like, my aura is probably very comforting, and it's very... It's not the same sort of aura or, like, psychic energy you'd get from a curse, right? Like, it's not aggressive. It's not fiendish. It is, like, a friendly energy. It's, like, a warmth. Literally, it's a warmth. It's a firelight. Um, and I think, too, yeah, I think... Um, I think... Oh, that's kind of cool. That's kind of a cool idea. Like, um, you know, she says, um, My name's Kisara. And she, like, takes a step forward towards us um, as, as, like, we extend our hand to, like, kind of take our hand. And when the firelight from our staff sort of, like, illuminates her body, like, she actually becomes, like, more corporeal. You know what I mean? Like, um, she, we actually get to kind of see what she would have looked like more in life versus this, like, hollow reflection of, like, her death, you know? Um... And she's, and she's younger. Um, she's fair, but I think, um, you know, maybe covered in, in like a little dust and like dirt. Definitely a bit unkempt. Um, yeah, you get the feeling that, um, uh, once again, definitely sort of a down on your luck kind of, kind of person. Um, and we sort of, we sort of take her hand. We don't really shake it. We just sort of hold it, uh, with intent. And you know we're sort of radiating that that light, which is bringing her some level of some level of peace. Um, and I think there's even like a like a faint smile that might crack at the corner of her lips. Um, 
you do not know what this one is, but it is important to you, as you are to it. This one is a firelight. It is something of a, a guide. It is something of a shepherd. It wishes to take you to the place that you belong, away from the darkness here, the cold, the unforgiving, the curses. Do you understand? Um, and there is sort of like a, a look of acknowledgement that, that comes over Kisara. Um, but she looks towards the beacon, which is still yet unlit. Um, and she says, I think I do. I, I remember coming here because I'd heard that the fires help, help us. They help. They help make us whole again, but this one never lit, and I think I just stayed here waiting, waiting for it to come back, and it, and it never did. And then she, like, looks at our staff, which is, of course, burning. Can you, can you bring the fire back? Can you help it burn again? Um... And there's like a sage and solemn nod from Last Wish. This one can. Or this one believes it can. It has already begun. And, you know, Last Wish extends it, you know, its arm out toward the flame, towards the, um, towards the beacon. We can see there's a low fire already burning, not quite sweeping, um, the waste uh, as it should be, but, you know, making a, a slow kindle happen. Um, to do so, I will need your help. I will need the help of one ready to pass on, to help ignite the fire. You've been waiting for a long time. I would like to give you deliverance from this, from this waiting. It would bring me this one great honor if you would be the first to be ascended. Um, and you can see she kind of releases Last Wish's hand and like backs up a moment and like puts a hand over her heart. The information is very heavy and very sudden. Um, and she seems... Um, very much, um, very much distraught. And she once again starts, like, darting her eyes towards all the direction of all the different pillars. Uh, and she says, I, I want to, I, there's a part of me that wants to. There's a part of me that's, that's screaming out to say, yes, I, I've been here for so long and I, I can hardly remember how long it's been. And, like, she's starting to get very emotional. Uh, and Last Wish uh, nods sagely once again. I am new. This one is new to this place, but it understands that it is very old. Older than all of us. Older than time. You've not been here so long, I imagine, but a great many years spent wandering. You've come so far. We are right here. Let me help you. Um, and she darts her eyes back towards the obelisks again and says, I can't. I can't yet. And... Last Wish is very surprised and says, You can't. And why not? Simply follow me. I will show you the way. This one will show you the way. It is its purpose. Um, and she says, No, no, you don't understand. I, I came... I came here for a very specific 
purpose. Yes, the beacon. This one understands. No, not the beacon. You don't... When I was different, when I was alive, I did... I did some regrettable things. I did some unkind things. I... I took things that didn't belong to me. I... I hurt people that that didn't deserve it. And and at the time I told myself it was because I had to. Because I had to stay alive and there was only so many ways you could do that and sometimes you had to be hard to live in a hard world. But I also think I also think I knew, to a certain extent, that I was wrong, and I'd gone too far. Sometimes I'd done things just because they brought me joy, they brought me simple, stupid, fleeting pleasures at other people's expense. I, I didn't think... I would live to the next day, so what was what was the point of of living small in the ones that I had? And people suffered for it. And Last Wish is sort of thinking on what she's saying and taking a look at where she's come. You're looking to find the story of your life. Here, in the stones. Yes. It sounds to me, to this one, that you already know this story. You are holding on to a pain, a grief, that is long past. Make peace with it. Release it. Now, you don't understand, I... Before everything ended, I, I knew, I realized that I'd not been a good person, and I, I was taking steps to do better. I... There was a lot of money that I owed to some people, and they were going to collect it in a way that was not coin, and they were going to collect it from people that meant a lot to me, from my sister, and I, I had done everything I could to get that money together, to prepare it for delivery. I was, I'd sent it through a courier, I was on my way to deliver the message, and I remember being in the square, and there was a sound behind me, and then everything went dark, and the next thing I know, I, I was here. You were taken from your life. Before, before I knew, before I knew that I had done that one shred of good, before I knew that I'd paid off my debt, and spared my sister of a fate that was not hers to answer for. I never knew... I never knew if the message arrived. I never knew if the money changed hands. I never knew if they extracted payment from my family. And I've been coming here for who knows how long, searching in these stones for my story to see how it ends, to see if in the end I had done what I would needed to do to make things right. And I've never found it. I don't know. I don't know if I made things right. And I don't think I can pass on until I know. And last wish, 
puts all those pieces together. This one understands. You made great strides in those last moments. No matter what happens, how the story ends, know that this one respects your choice, what you did. It was honorable, no matter the outcome. And there's a flash of, of thanks, of thankfulness. That's all well and good wish. I appreciate it, but I don't know if it spared my sister. I don't know if it cleaned our name. I don't know. I don't know if, if that's enough. That is fine. You know very little of this one. How heavy can my words carry? But now that I know, now that this one knows more of you, perhaps we can work together. I can help you see, maybe find, if what you've done, what you tried to do, came to pass. Uh, and she gets very excited. Um, a, ver a big shift in her emotions. Do you think you could? Is, is that a power that, is that a power that you have? This one does not know all that it can do. <laughs> uh, admittedly, he like, like he, they raised their hands. Uh, this one wishes they could say they weren't born yesterday, but it would be a lie. This one knows that it is linked to the fire. It is linked to the souls of the past. Perhaps it has a way of helping you where you have fallen short in your own task. Come, let us see. Uh, and just sort of picks a direction and starts walking towards one of the obelisks. So let's see, let's, uh, let's let the story decide. Um, so in this situation, what would we, what would we be doing? Getting an answer from the oracle, maybe? Or searching for treasures, maybe? When you trade treasures for knowledge, decide on a number of treasures to expend. Hmm. Buy information. Is this, is this a moment where I could possibly use some of the treasure to help influence my roles? I guess first, let's see, let's get an answer from the Oracle. Is the story of Kisara in the stones? That's gonna be our first question. Is the story of Kisara in the stones? Oh, we discard jokers. Oof, big rolls. Um. Once again, we're gonna be patient on this one. Okay, so nine, 10, 11. Um, so let's see. Uh, draw two cards face up, roll and sum your action dice, add any modifiers. Um, zero if unlikely, plus one if otherwise. So, whoa. Um, so 50, 50, so it's a 10 all, t all, all together. Um, which if your score is higher than both cards, there's light. So it's yes. And yes. And interesting. Um, and what, <laughs> and what is the question? Um, and okay we are going to say that last light begins to walk around um 
the field, looking, trying to feel for an obelisk that holds the story of Kisara. And almost intrinsically, especially with Kisara in tow, like I think there's a part of, of Last Light that kind of intrinsically feels the stories around him and like the, the, the things written in the stone. But now that he's kind of doing what he's meant to do, he's shepherding a soul, right? It's kind of like they're bonded in a way, like their auras kind of merge. And so not only can, he, he kind of can like almost pin Pragana, it feels like a, a pinpoint of energy, uh, which is like linked to Kisara and her her life, you know? Um, And so, <laughs> last slide, that's the name of the character, walks over to one of the obelisks and the obelisk, you know, is not really one that, um, that it's not like in the untold amount of time that Kassar would have been in the veil, like that she couldn't have seen, probably would have stumbled across it at one point. But I think what is important is that we are here now, right? And so when we approach the obelisk with a soul nearby and our light of our staff descends across the stones, the stones like are stacked in such a way, the obelisks are stacked in such a way they have multiple sides, right? They're kind of like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, octagonal, right? Yeah, uh, maybe they're like octagonal panels, right? And each side holds different stories on them. Uh, as we approach and our fire gets nearby, it's almost like the stone reacts to our presence with the presence of Kisara and the panel sort of shoo-hoom, 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 shoo-hoom. they start twisting, right? And shifting and the symbols then align differently and the pictures shift slightly uh, until you can see um, that they kind of form a whole new symbol, a whole new uh, rune that depicts a different story, a different life. And uh, Kisara then, now that she's in our presence and the obelisk has, has revealed itself to her, um, can now view it. Um, and, you know, very excitedly, she like rushes forward uh, and last wish um, reaches a hand out and like kind of clasps her wrist before she has a chance to get too close. Um, and she seems surprised. Whatever you see, know that you have spent a long time repenting. You have spent a great deal of your infinite existence thinking of the wrongs you have done and how you would undo them. Whatever happened in your past has happened, and it is still true, but it does not make the good work that you have done since untrue. Um, and she nods. There's a part of her that wants to refute last wish there's a part of her that feels she's only redeemable if you know she's if she's right <laughs> if if the if it has happened the way that she hopes it has happened um and she he releases her hand she steps forward towards the obelisk and sort of stares into the symbol and as she does so, the symbol kind of lights with this like ethereal bluish kind of ghostly energy um, that sort of reflects back into her light, into her eyes. Uh, and it kind of pulls out until it almost creates like a, a mirrored surface, like a, a discus of swirling energy. Um, and that energy kind of becomes a, a portal, almost like a looking glass into a previous moment in time. And she's sort of watching her life now and she's watching her life um almost like as if it's like an out-of-body experience like she can see herself um in a third person and she's watching her history unfold and she can see herself um walking through the market that day after she dropped off the missive after she dropped off the coins 
all of that stuff. Um, and she's walking her way back through the market, like with her hood up, trying to get her way back home before anything bad happens. Um, but then unfortunately, uh, she turns a corner in an alleyway and once again, sort of watching this all happen to her, like outside of herself, which has to be a very arresting experience. Um, she sees like another figure from the bazaar sort of trail behind her, sort of nonchalantly into the same alleyway uh, and begin to tail her. Uh, and she uh, takes a moment to sort of, um, there's like a, there's like a break in the alleyway. So she's sort of like, a, there's like another offshoot down a hall and she puts her hand on the stone to so like turn and like take a look around the corner. And as soon as she peeks, um, from her perspective, her out of body perspective, uh, she can see this figure like reach into its jacket and pull out just like a like a, a club, you know, sort of like a metal studded plank of wood and just whap, just like on the back of the head. Um, and, you know, her body just goes limp and falls f like face first into the stones. And, um, you know, the person takes a look at the body, sort of nudges it with the foot a couple times, lifeless, nothing going on. Uh, leans down, sort of like pats through the clothes real quick, trying to feel for any like important object or like coin purse. Probably finds like a handful of of, of coins, uh, snatches them away, flips flips her over. Any like notable clothing, like anything important, anything like be worth salvaging. Doesn't look like it. Uh, and honestly, probably just leaves the corpse there. Doesn't even doesn't even bother like trying to hide it. Um, and just sort of sneaks away. And so she like sees that moment and then like her spirit can kind of like float through the rest of her life. And she sort of um, follows this figure through the bazaar, through some alleyways and like through this complex network of like um, merchant stalls and like um, fronts in like trinket shops and butcheries and like whatever, like passing like secret pass phrases and all that stuff until they eventually find themselves in this sort of like den of like gamblers and, 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 you know, um, crooked, crooked shopkeeps and like, you know, the, the usual suspects when it comes to like a den of depravity and, and, uh, and like big spenders. Um, and the figure approaches this, um, sort of muscular, bald headed, um, tattooed, man wearing a bunch of very fanciful rings on uh his fingers uh with a couple of um with a couple of like gold uh encrusted teeth <laughs> you know uh, sort of like playing a playing a game of cards and the the sort of hooded figure who had just like clocked um kasara approaches uh their table and says i took care of that thing that you needed me to and the figure, like, not even, like, looking up from, uh, his cards, says, That's pretty vague. You wanna get more specific? I ask you to do a lot of things. The girl. The one who owed. Uh, let's just say she's not gonna be a problem anymore in terms of, uh, overdue payments. And, like, reaches down into his pocket and has like the coin purse and like slides it over to him like across the table and you can see like the man sort of like gives it like a wary gaze and like snorts um and like kind of looks up at him with like very uninterested eyes and says how many coins do you think are in that coin purse i don't know i didn't really have enough time to count does it look like it'd be the amount that she owed well, no, because she owed a lot, but, you know, it's proof that she's not a problem. She already wasn't a problem, Cask. And he, like, reaches down into his, like, coin purse, and he, re and he pulls out an opened note with some marked bills and coins on it. She paid this morning. Um, and to this, the one named Cask, uh, sort of like, you know, there's, I don't want to say there's a look of like shock on his face because he doesn't really care, but it's sort of like a look of like, like, oh shit. Like I really put myself out today to do this. He's like, ah, 
I mean, no one told me. No one, no one had said anything. It's all right. It's all right. Nobody else has been sent out, right? After uh, what's her name? Uh, Elisa. Yeah, Elisa, uh, the young one, right? Yeah, no one's doing that now. Well, no. Unless you told him to. I didn't. I'm just making sure you didn't do anything rash again. No, I was waiting to see uh, what she had in her pocket, so... Looks like she's paid up. Looks like she's paid up. And so, like, then Cass goes to, like, reach for the coin purse that he scavenged from from Kisara, but the boss, like, puts his hand over that coin purse, too, and, like, slides it back toward him. We'll say that just makes good on your next delivery. Yeah, of course. My next delivery. You got it, boss. And, like, uh, turns around to walk away uh, and says, the boss calls after him, no one saw you take care of Kisara, right? Not a soul. Good. Keep it that way. Make yourself scarce. And the hooded figure nods, wheels around, probably like curses under his breath from being shortchanged from his from his delivery, and then escapes back into the bazaar. And um, with that, I think. Um, Kisara's spirit now still in the veil sort of eyes crack open and um, sort of finds herself back in the afterlife um, and there's just a mix of emotions like you know she's just had to watch herself go through the traumatic experience of watching herself die like firsthand um, to be talked about so callously and like uselessly by like these very callous figures um, but most importantly, learning that she did, in fact, make good on her payment, despite the fact that, she, you know, she was dealt with un unjustly, um, and that her family was safe, that these thugs never tried to barrel down on them or extract anything from them. And so there was just, like, tears of joy, um, and... You know, I think, like, just kind of shakes her to her core, kind of just falls to her knees in front of the obelisk and is, like, sobbing. Um, and uh, Last Wish, of course, gives her, like, a healthy distance and, like, lets her, like, work through that as long as she needs to. Um, and when she finally sort of begins to collect herself, uh, Last Wish bends down, sort of cradles down on his haunches, with the, the flame nearby and, like, reaches a hand out and, like, puts it on her shoulder. This one believes you have seen what you needed to see. Still not quite sure how to gauge her emotions, you know? Um, and, like, through, like, choke back sobs, you know, she's like, yes, I, I saw, I saw what I needed to see. Is it what you wanted to see? Um, and she almost, like, laughs in spite of herself, like, through her tears, and just sort of, like, smiles and says, yes, it's what I, it's what I wanted to see, thank you. Um, and Wish, like, nods, his, nods their head and says, there is no need to thank. It is what I was brought here to do. There is one other thing I was brought here to do. If you are ready. Um, and she sort of like stands up for a moment and takes one last look into the mirror of energy that is before her. And I think, you know, in that reflection, she gets a chance to see her family. Um, and she gets to see her sister and she gets to see any, I, I, you know, in my mind, I don't know why in my mind's eye, I imagine it's, um, just her mother and her sister. I, don't, I think maybe the father's gone. I don't know why I'm just like leaning into that. Um, but I think I get to see them. I think they, she gets to see them safe, happy. Uh, I think she gets to see them, you know, unaccosted by these, these, these thieves and thugs. 
Um, she gets to see her sister sort of like, I want to say like take a higher road, you know, maybe like really applies herself at a trade or like at school and like become very successful and like help dig her family out of the poverty that like forced Kisara into like some of the dark deeds that she had to do in order to get by um, and all those things. And I think, you know, although she's very sad because she never got to be a part of it and she never got to watch her sister grow up and, you know, be the person that she'd always like would hope she would be. Um, you know, I think there is a great sense of peace that is achieved through watching it sort of secondhand. She gets to see like a whole life happen in moments, you know, um, which is both sad and beautiful, right? Because otherwise she would have never seen this, never known this. Um, even though, as much as she wishes she could be there, um, she just sort of gets to watch from afar from the future. Um, and after she experiences all of that and she truly knows that like the last thing that she did in life helped pave the way for her family to have the life that she like wanted for them and that she in her mind has been redeemed, right? Um, she like nods at last wish and says, I'm very ready. Thank you. Lead the way. Um, and last wish does the best he can, they can do with a smile for a mantis, uh, and nods and like walks back towards the fire back towards the, the beacon, which is still sort of rumbling with a low iridescent struggling flame. Um, with Kisara at, at their side. Uh, and sort of just stands a bit reticent, a bit hesitant, almost like, you know, their antenna twitching, sort of trying to make sense of the feelings around the fire. And Kisara says, is everything all right? And um, Last Wish cuts a glance at her and says, this one believes so. Uh, you'll have to forgive Last Wish. They've never done this. Um, and that, like, she, she, like, kind of, like, smirks, uh, you know, and there's almost, like, a bit of a, of, of a gasp, like, sort of, like, a, a chuckle, <laughs> like, that escapes her. Um, this is a day of firsts for the both of us. <laughs> to that, you would be, you would be right, Kisara. Um, and sort of, like, begins to pace around the, the beacon as if trying to listen for, um, or like feel the right way to go about this. You know, the voices had told them that they had to deliver a soul here for, to help light the, the beacon, but that's kind of like as far as it went. Um, and eventually I think, um, eventually it finds themselves sort of like um, in a prayer like or like meditative gesture before the fire, almost as if trying to commune with it directly. Um, feeling, who knows how long this takes. Maybe it takes much longer than Last Wish has anticipated and it kind of is like wearing on their self-confidence and their and their faith a bit that they, that you know, they've got this far and they've still not, they still don't even know how to turn the damn thing on essentially. Um, and maybe it's feeling a bit crestfallen. It sort of falls on their knees and like holds their staff in front of them and like leans their head against the staff uh and like sort of to themselves in their in their mind says um protectors last wish has done what you have asked of them to do the soul is here and the soul is willing but i cannot but this one cannot light the flame alone how do we help this soul pass on? How do we help Kisara? Um, and once again, I think there's like an explosion of sound in the back of um, Last Wish's mind um, as the voice uh, begins to... Oh, actually, 
Maybe I'm feeling something a bit more subtle. I'm gonna I'm gonna backtrack that. I think I think Last Wish prays to himself. Same thing I just said. But then Kasara, right, feels sees and feels that Last Wish is like crestfallen and is like sad and is like confused. And so walks up beside Last Wish to like console them. Um and says, it's been a while now and the fire still is low. Is everything okay? I do not know. This one does not know. This one has asked. It has not yet received. The fire burns, but not bright enough. This one, this one does not have an answer. Um, and Kisara says, sometimes it always helped me to just clear my mind a bit. Maybe we, we wait together. And so she'll take a kneel beside Last Wish. Um, and in so doing, I think the fire begins to burn a little brighter, you know? Uh, now that they're both seated in front of, of the flame sort of quietly. And this sort of like perks last wishes um, interest. Um, and he sort of, they sort of crane their head over to Kasara and says, you said you would clear your mind. What did you mean? Um, and Kisara says, I don't know, I would think about, um, you know, I would just try to not think about the thing that I was struggling with. I would try to think about things that, um, made me happy, um, my favorite songs, uh, my favorite games that I would play with my family, with my sister, and, like, the fire begins to burn a little brighter as she's, like, thinking about these memories, um, and Last Wish picks up on that and says, favorite games, yes, and songs? Uh, with your sister, Alicia. Yes. From the vision. Um, and Kassara doesn't even seem to notice that the fire is burning brighter, right? To, to her, it's like still a low, a r low rumble. And she smiles and she says, yes, like games with my sister, like Alicia. And the name, <sighs> the fire like burns a little bright, brighter. Um, and then says... And once again, Last Wish is like now beginning to, to, I think, feel and sense what the fire wants um, and says, ah, uh, Last Wish uh, knows very little games, uh, being that they have just arrived here in the Vale. Uh, perhaps you can teach this one a game, your favorite game. Um, and then... She sort of, like, shrugs her shoulders and, like, laughs and says, well, I feel like there's probably a better way that you could be using your time, but okay, uh, if if it helps, sure, I can teach you my favorite game. Um, and she sort of looks down to, like, some of the, the sticks and the rocks that have, like, been blown up on top of the, the pedestal for a long time, and she starts setting them up. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of like a game of tic-tac-toe or like jacks where you have to like jump rocks and sticks and like people will take more depending on how far they've like skipped a stone or like uh or if they've moved a stick or something she's like explaining the rules yeah so this one's called um you know um <laughs> what's like a fun like kids game for like a thief uh <laughs> uh says uh this one's called the five finger discount uh and so this is what you have to do you have to um you know, skip the stone. If you hit that stick, it's this many. You can take this many sticks. Uh, but if you pass it over, you get this many sticks. Once you have five, and she's like explaining the rules, and the fire's burning more and more. And, you know, uh, she says, oh, Alicia was so good at this game. Like, she would beat me every single time. It doesn't matter how hard I tried. There's only one thing I could ever do to beat her. And it's if I could do this thing right here. And she's like doing the sticks uh, with Last Wish. And Last Wish is like, doing ah like this this is the one you could not beat eh? and it's like doing the same thing and at this point has completely like enveloped her in the memory of playing five finger discount with her sister and the flame is now really really strong 
uh, and they're like, um, they're going through the game, and as they're playing, it gets stronger and stronger. And I think there gets to be a point where, um, you know, they're 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 playing the game, and she's saying that she never wins, and Last Wish kind of picks up on that, and so he's like doing the thing that Alicia would, that would always do to beat Kasara. Uh, and then, like, sort of at the last moment, sort of, like, very slyly, uh, does, like, a play to, like, throw the game a bit. You know, like, like could have maybe pulled a game-winning move, but, like, does something a little off in the rules so that, like, it puts her in a position to win. And then she takes the game, you know? And she, like, sort of excitedly, like, stands up and, like, raises her hands in the air. And she's like, yes! Like, I, I knew that I could do that. I knew, like, Alicia was just too quick, but I knew you could do it. And, um, you know, Last Wish starts, you know, laughing and, like, clapping his hands. says, you're very nimble, Kisara. An, an apt opponent. Surprised you never took those wins from your sister. Um, and um, she, like, laughs and she, like, smiles. Uh, and you can see, like, as she's standing there before the fire, you know, she does look more corporeal now, right? Like, the flame is so bright that she looks pretty much entirely mortal and human now. Um... But there's also something that she doesn't realize, and that's is sort of like the ends of her, the ends of her body, although they look more corporeal, it almost looks like they're sort of drifting off into like a smoke, and they're beginning to join the the smoke that is like buzzing around the bottom of the flame. You know what I mean? It it almost looks as if there's like a slow ember that's like crawling across her skin, but it doesn't look painful. She doesn't even notice that it's happening. Um, she just like still like laughing and smiling and like throwing her hands up in the air. Uh, and she says, I cannot believe that I never got to do that with her. I would, I, she would have, I would have rubbed it in her face. She would have been so embarrassed. Uh, and like, as she's like laughing, like more of the flames, the embers are burning, like more and more of her looks like she's like fading into the fire. Uh, and like last wish is sort of seeing her dissipate and like seeing her join the beacon and like, She's just smiling. She seems very content. She seems very warm. And uh, Penis just sort of smiles uh, and says, Well, perhaps you'll have a chance to tell her. Um, and I think with that, Kisara finally understands what's happening to her. And she, like, looks down. And she can see that her, like, mostly human form is, like, kind of, like, half fade and is, like, burning into the fire. But it doesn't hurt. You know, she's just, there's less of her here. And there's like a bit of a gasp of realization, but then like a smile. And I'm starting to get like emotional. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's like a, maybe even like a bit of tears welling up behind her eyes. And she looks at Last Wish and she says, I will, thank you. Uh, and Last Wish says, there is no thanks needed. It is what I'm here to do. Um, and like with that last sort of exchange, there's like a strong wind and the rest of her body whoosh, sort of like whiffs out into embers and smoke and whoosh, sort of spins into the beacon and the beacon whoosh, like bursts into a column of flame that like reaches up and outwards and like burns like almost like a, like a, like a, a spear of, of fire into the sky for a moment, um, that, Probably everyone can see from miles around, both uh, unliving souls and curses alike. Um, and for a moment, the area around the beacon, you know, this place that was corrupted and turned harsh and cold and sharp and, and nightmarish, um, glows with that same sort of like iridescence, that same warmth, that same sort of like uh, psychedelic um, comfort that dreamlike state that it was meant to have. And it sort of washes out. And then a lot of that gravel sort of like begins to be blown away as like small pockets of that soft bedded grass where people would once lay uh, and like find peace in their stories begins to like shiver, shimmer its way back into reality. Um, and of course it'll take some time for that place to fully heal and repair but as the fire finally kind of like slowly burns down from a, a, a greatly explosive, you know, um, blast of energy to a manageable, ever-burning, um, uh, churning fire uh, built on those like ever-burning birch wood trees, 
uh, Last Wish does get the sense that um, that the healing is inevitable for this place. And the beacon now burns with like a newfound light and a newfound energy um, that will continue to help souls be guided in the future. And this will be the first of many beacons, the first of six beacons uh, that he will have to find. They will have to find um, if they want to help the rest of the lost souls in the veil. Uh, and I think with that, they'll lean forward, um, nod their head towards the flame, and sort of like lean their staff into it to sort of like capture some of the new um, beacon fire in their staff and sort of like pull it out and like smile at it warmly. It still looks much much the same, but there's sort of like a newfound energy to it. It, it dances with like a, with like a, it kindles and dances with like a different kind of step, you know? Uh, and, um, uh, you know, with head nodded towards the fire. Thank you, Kisara. Be at peace. Um, and turns around and then looks towards the nearest exit out of the, the valley and begins moving that way. And uh, I think that's where we'll end the first session of Firelights. Uh, I think that's the perfect uh, first ending. Wow. Okay. So, it, it, pfft, a lot. <laughs> Pretty wild how three pages of a PDF with some abstract prompts and some good world building can turn into some pretty emotional story points. <laughs> uh, deep, says Mochi. Yes, I agree. Um, I mean, I guess that's what you kind of have to expect when the game is all about, uh, you know, helping to ferry souls of, of people uh, across into their, to their next, to their next stage of life. But wow, very cool. Um, I dig it. I dig, I dig the simplicity. I dig the ease of use. Oh, I have so much to write for the queen of clubs space. Um, yeah, I had fun. I had fun with this. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I'm cool. I'm, I, I, I'd like to keep covering indie RPGs and solo RPGs and things like that. I think I'll run this again. I think I'll run this until I hit all six beacons. Once again, I like that it has a definitive beginning, middle, and end. I like that I know that I can light all six beacons and end the story. Um, the story. Um, so yeah, I think I'll run this again. Um, but wow, what a, what a heart-wrenching tale. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed myself though, so I think I think this will be run again. Absolutely, I think this is the first of Benny for Firelight. Um, I'm gonna put this back onto the just chat. There we go. Uh, so hey y'all, for all of you who uh, are still with us, I know Mochi's been here from beginning to end. As always, thank you, Mochi. Uh, what have you been watching? If you're just tuning in now, miraculously, uh, this is Level One Adventuring. Uh, we are a uh, RPG and TTRPG stream dedicated to both pen and paper and digital RPGs. We do solo RPGs and group RPGs. Uh, I am Wolf Scott. I am your host and game master. Uh, what was today? What was tonight? Uh, this was Firelights. Oh, and my phone just died, <laughs> so I can't read the full name. But by uh, by Rene, Rene Pierre. Uh, I will link, if you're watching this on, if you're watching this on Twitch, um, our Twitter account will have the link to this episode and, and I will, I will post the link to buy this, um, on there at six bucks, which is wild for how cool it is. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube later, I will also attach a link in the description box below so that you can download this and play this for yourself. Um, but yes, uh. Rene Pierre, uh, this is called Firelights. Uh, two pages, three foldable <laughs> columns of rules, and you get a really heartfelt story generator um, that can take you to some pretty weird and cool places. So yeah, beautiful stuff. That's what you watch tonight. Uh, I'm Wolf Scott. Follow us on all the things. Uh, as I mentioned before, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. Uh, follow us on Discord. We can talk about all the new games that are going to be shown on the stream in the near future and play some games with us if you are so inclined. 
Uh, and with that, shout out to Tabletop Audio for the cool sound effects that we had this game. Shout out to Streamlabs and Streamspell for all the digital and visual elements of the stream. Uh, affiliate link down below to help yourself out with that if you uh, need to upgrade your streams. And I think with that, I think we're going to call it. Uh, today's Wednesday, which means we're probably not going to be streaming until next week. But bonus bonus points good good news is that i think next week is that we have enough people to actually play the D, D campaign again so all of your favorites actually i don't know if everybody will be there most of your favorites will be there to be in the campaign and roll dice and have the stories happen again in the land of mira with percy and the rest um so we are very excited to see you there if you can join thursday we'd appreciate it i mean wednesday we'd appreciate it otherwise join us uh for any of the other games that we have going on rocking on and I think with that, uh, I have to make sure my cat didn't, <laughs> I don't know, twist her ankle when she fell on top of me earlier uh, and crawl myself into bed. So thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Uh, and until then, I appreciate your time and energy. Be so well. Uh, I'll see you later.